My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Thursday, February 2nd, 2017. I'm here with Gerald Serrata at his home in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Jerry, do I have your permission to record this interview? Absolutely. Great. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, particularly your involvement in the New York Chabara, and also the impact the Chabara has had on your own life and mm. on American Jewry more mm -hmm. broadly. I'd like to begin by talking about your personal and family background and to flesh out a bit who you were at the time that you got involved. Uh, so let's begin with your family. When you were growing up, you were born in 1946 in Miami. Uh, Florida. And so can you tell us a little bit about your family? You yeah, also when you say Miami, it conjures up a different image than Miami in 1946, which was a sleepy southern segregated town. Yeah. Uh, so my mother had been there since the 20s and my father uh, was stationed there in the war and that's where they met. They met because they were fixed up through the National Council of Jewish Women. My parents were Southern Jews uh, in, in that sense, at least my mother was, and my grandfather was the founder of, or one of the founders of a major reform congregation in Miami in the 1920s. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, definitely a, a Southern Jew, and part of uh, my background is the liberal Southern Jewish experience. Uh, our synagogue was involved in every cause you could think of, particularly civil rights. Um, and uh, that was where my connection to Judaism was very strongly through my parents' activism, particularly my mother's. She was on the National Commission of Social Action of the Reform Movement, but the synagogue itself was, was involved in, uh, in public affairs. My synagogue youth group, uh, TIFTI, Temple Israel Federation of Temple Youth, went outside the synagogue walls with, within uh, couple miles was Liberty City and we did voter registration in the summer of uh, 1963 in the black ghettos of Liberty City. So I always felt that that was part of my Jewish identity and that was the, 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 the Passover seders we had focused on uh, contemporary issues and we were religious reform Jews. We went uh, almost every Friday night and certainly all the, the holidays. So Jewish identity was a very strong part of my upbringing, but Jewish observance, uh, in the way you'd think of it, conservative orthodox terms, was not. Tell me a little bit about um, what your parents did. I just want to back up and yeah. fill in some of the pieces. Yeah, um, yeah. My father was a dentist, uh, uh, practiced on Miami Beach uh, until he retired at the age of 80 uh, from dentistry. Just passed away at the age of 99 and three quarters. And uh, my mother was a homemaker when you had to fill out the forms those days. They, they were called homemakers, but her, her job was a social justice activist. She was the president of League of Women Voters for the state of Florida. She was on the National Commission of Social Action. Um, she was created the first public television station, uh, not created, but helped get it started. Uh, uh, and um, by, the, by uh, later on, she used to, uh, uh, she had a list of people that she would recommend candidates to. So, uh, and once you have a large list, candidates come to your home to uh, to meet you. So she was active in regular uh, political affairs, uh, endorsing progressive uh, candidates. My, my parents voted for Henry Wallace in 1948. So I was a, a pink diaper baby, a Jewish pink diaper baby. Yeah. Um, and you have siblings? Yes. I'm the oldest, oldest surviving. My parents lost a child uh, 11 months before I was born. But then they had four children. I'm the oldest of the four. Um, tell me a little bit more about what Miami Beach was like at the time you were growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, not like it is today. Uh, at that point, uh, it was probably 80% uh, uh, Jewish. Um, my high school was the. Uh, about that percentage, so so was my elementary. I went through public schools all the way up in in Miami Beach. Um, we were such proud Reform Jews that I would come on the second day of the festival, and and there would be me and a handful of Catholic uh, kids, and uh, we would watch movies all day because there weren't any students in the in the school. Uh, but my parents and I I did it also. I felt 
very proud uh, about uh, my Reformed Jewish identity and uh, that if I observed only one day of the festival, I was going to be in school the next day. So how did Reformed Jews fit into the larger sort of Jewish demographic? Well, at that point uh, in, in Miami, again, unlike today and unlike Miami Beach today, there were almost no Orthodox Jews. There was a small, small Orthodox shul on 40th Street. We lived on 51st Street in, in Miami Beach. So everybody was Reform or Conservative. Um, the, the elderly community on South Beach was mostly uh, retired left-wing uh, types, very, very progressive, and many of them secularists. So there was a kind of a progressive secular community, but very much impoverished. Uh, what's now the, the, the South Beach was uh, full of SROs. The, the, that Art Deco district was run down hotels, mostly elderly Jews. Uh, who were politically active but not involved in the Jewish community. So you were describing the Jewish environment in your home. Um, mm -hmm. uh, can you just say a little bit more about that? Um, mm -hmm. what, what holidays were important to you? Mm -hmm. Did you celebrate Shabbat on a regular basis? We celebrated with Friday night dinner, candles, Kiddush challah. That was not, not so much, uh, I don't recall until I got to be the age where everybody was having B'nai Mitzvah, or Bar Mitzvahs, there were almost, I doubt that there were any uh, 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 Benot Mitzvah at that time. Can't recall a single one. Um, but uh, Shabbat was Friday night for us, and was going to temple, and hearing a powerful social justice sermon that would carry through for the, the rest of the week. Uh, the message was 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 very very strong uh, in terms of pride of Jewish identity and and how we cared about the world around us. Um, we observe all the uh, festivals, particularly uh, Pesach. We had a very large seder for extended family and community. My mother edited the Haggadah, it was called the Sarada Haggadah, uh, which is as much social justice stuff as we could pull together until Arthur Waskow created the Freedom uh, Seder, and then we started using that with, instead of the Sarada Haggadah. So uh, on Sukkot, we would uh, create a little model of a sukkah that we put on the table, So we, uh, which is, I guess, what the synagogue did have a, a, a large, in the patio, had a, had a sukkah. But, so we kind of connected to Sukkot, but we never thought of building one uh, in, in our home. The high, this at the time the, our congregation was huge, uh, over 2,000 families. So the the uh, Yamim Noreen, the High Holy Days, were observed. The, the synagogue was in downtown Miami. Actually, we lived in Miami Beach, so we we drove. Uh, weren't observant in any way of uh, traditional uh, Shabbat observance, but uh, other than going to shul um, or to temple, but. The temple would come to our side of the uh, causeway on the High Holy Days because the only places big enough were, were the Miami Beach Auditorium and then the Miami Beach Convention Center, where there'd be six or seven thousand people at services. So those were quite powerful uh, experiences uh, in, in terms of being part of a huge congregation of people. Um, and as far as we could tell, all of them were as connected to. Uh, social justice work as we were, although my mother was certainly the leader of it, of the activities in the congregation. Tell us a little bit more about your uh, Jewish education. So I uh, requested a bar mitzvah. It was not normal in the reform congregations in most of the country uh, uh, in the 50s. Confirmation was what people did, and they were, the reform movement at that point was still proud of keeping people to the ninth or 10th grade. So confirmation was what they expected going through ninth or 10th grade. At age but, 16, pretty much, right? Uh, 15 or 16, uh, really 14 or 15. It was ninth grade or 10th grade. Um, so of course, the culmination of, of Sunday school would have been confirmation. So all of, all of the girls, uh, uh, that's, all, that's what they did. They went through the ninth, I think ours was ninth grade, actually, but a few, boys wanted to, to have a bar mitzvah and the, the synagogue relented 
Um, and I actually went to, next, I started Hebrew school earlier than most. Most started in fifth grade, I started in fourth grade. So my Jewish education was primarily Sunday school, but all the way through, I went through 12th grade. And um, I, I don't even remember why. Uh, and my uncle, who had grown up in the congregation, my mother's brother, uh, didn't have a bar mitzvah. Why I, did I, you want one? I don't remember. I get, it could be, well, no, I don't think it was because uh, uh, I had a lot of friends in, congreg in conservative congregations. Uh, there were no, and, until I was in high school, there were no Orthodox Jews at the, at, at the Miami Beach High School uh, or in the public schools that, that went to the small day school uh, that existed in Miami, very small. Um, in your high school, were there uh, a preponderance of either Reform Jews or conservative Jews? It's Did probably half and half. Half and half. So yeah. reform was very strongly represented. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. There was one large uh, conservative congregation on Miami Beach, and a, another a, a, a moderate sized one, uh, or two moderate sized ones in the northern part of Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, so there was there was reform and conservative. Those were the two flavors. Uh, uh, and absolutely no contact with the Orthodox community until in high school a couple of kids I don't uh, probably um, who were more academically gifted and their parents decided they would send them to the public school rather than uh, the day school that was there I, I think because they were very smart kids uh, that came over from the day school yeah. as you were saying earlier you were involved in the temple youth group right that was another I we um, there, there was a Southern uh, Youth Movement camp in Cleveland, Georgia, but I was never uh, interested in, uh, in summer camp, stay away camp, um, and there weren't any Jewish-oriented day camps. So my, my experience was really Sunday school and the four years of Hebrew school. Um, and uh, of course, we had to look hard to have a non-Jewish friend. We, uh, Miami Beach at that point, uh, uh, in our neighborhood, the immediate neighborhood, let's say there were 40 or 50 houses, there was one Christian family that had Christmas lights, but we could always go up to Bell Harbor, which was a restricted area where no Jews or blacks could live if we wanted to see Christmas lights. So we'd, we would go in our car in, on, during Christmas to go look. It was like going to a foreign country. Um, but Miami Beach was... Miami Beach, when I was born, was uh, uh, was was still had a curfew. Um, blacks couldn't be on Miami Beach after dark. I stopped in the late '40s, uh, but the ex the the discrimination that was equally uh, directed at Jews and uh, and blacks was uh, was there in Miami Beach. The country club that was down the street from our house uh, had no blacks and no Jewish members. And the Miami Beach Bath Club, right, right, Miami Beach, in a community where there were uh, eighty percent Jewish, was restricted. No Jews and no blacks could uh, could join. So there, there was a sense of exclusion, and there was also a sense of identification with the uh, black community, mm -hmm. um, since you could visibly see signs uh, at some of these places: no Jews and blacks allowed in the forties and fifties. What what kinds of activities, social justice activities? Uh, would you say that the youth group that you got involved mm -hmm. through your youth group? Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. I mean, the, the what was most uh, vivid was was actually going into the ghetto. I mean, we was high school kids. Uh, um, so I don't I don't recall strong activities aside from that. Uh, um, that must have made quite an impression. Though. Yeah, yeah. For sure. I mean, I, I can still, and the poverty was not, uh, I just hadn't seen it. I mean, it was the same community, but, and it were literally a mile away from the, the, the temple, Temple Israel, Greater Miami. Um, so the, the physical signs of poverty, the smells of poverty, I can, I can still remember it. I can still remember it. The, the movie Moonlight, which came out uh, recently, was filmed in, in areas that looked quite like the areas that uh, that we went door to door, young Jewish kids 
without, without fear, but a sense that this is what uh, this is what the God and the prophets wanted us to do. Other than that, I don't I don't recall. I mean, the synagogue for us, the rabbi's sermons were 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 powerful motives in the way we should think, um, and. Um, I, I remember my family uh, going to uh, black churches just in, in solidarity uh, um, and um, even though the most of the, really the only African Americans we knew growing up were were what were called day workers people if you you needed my mother uh, uh, didn't particularly care much for lawn doing laundry and cleaning the house so we'd have somebody come uh, over, they're called day workers, and you'd call an agency, and you'd get a day worker who would come to your house for a day. But we would then hire the the, the people and pay them more than the company would have paid them, and they became kind of family members. Uh, uh, so we, but that was the only rela relationships I had with African Americans. Mm. Uh, Looking back, what would you say were the most formative influences on your on your Jewish identity as mm -hmm. you were growing up? Well, my mother was the, was the strongest uh, influence on, on, on all of us, and, and including my father, who had come from a small, uh, small Orthodox uh, community in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, and he was very supportive and very sympathetic, but even his language had to change as we were growing up. I mean, still colored, he used the expression colored. We didn't use the expression uh, black. Uh, of course, nobody did in the society. We were very proud of uh, saying Negro instead of Nigra, let alone worse. Um, so uh, she, uh, as a role model uh, for us, was a very, very powerful influence. My rabbi, Joseph Narrett, uh, blessed memory, uh, was a powerful preacher. On what was his name? Narrett. It looked like it should have been pronounced Nairot, maybe it was at some point, N-A-R-O-T. Uh, but uh, um, he, uh, he was also from an Orthodox uh, background, and like many Orthodox rabbis who became Reform rabbis, this was the social justice message was, was what he taught. And our family was involved not just in civil rights, but ultimately um, Haitian refugees, uh, migrant workers, gay rights, this was, I was already in college and beyond, uh, but our family and the synagogue and, and the rabbi, uh, um, it was kind of the Jewish liberation theology uh, was what I was weaned on. Mm. Uh, you went to public schools, as you said, right. in Miami all the way through high school. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the, the social and political environment in your school mm -hmm. and, and how did that affect you? Mm. Well, we it, and until we were, I would say, in high school, we didn't realize that we were, we were in a segregated school. I mean, is your political consciousness, uh, you know, that, that that the schools in Miami were were segregated, were still entirely segregated. I graduated from high school in '64, and integration hadn't started. Completely separate school systems. Um, but this was a, a sort of typical suburban public school system pretty high quality for the South, certainly very high quality, uh, but um, mostly middle class and upper middle class. And the, the working class Jews and non-Jews who were there were kind of invisible, as I look back on it uh, now, and as I, I ended up being the president of the, of the student body, and I'm uh, re reflecting, because I had my 50th, uh, anniversary recently of, of who was not visible to us among our classmates and how they must have felt uh, those who were single parent families who lived in apartments rather than single family homes and uh, it, it wasn't as universally upper middle class as you would one might have thought uh, if you weren't paying attention but that was the, that was the norm upper, upper middle class Jewish suburban and progressive or um, yes, yeah, I would say, I would say to the extent, uh, but certainly the Jewish community in, in South Florida was, was liberal. There were some politicians that were 
uh, very well supported in the uh, community. There was a particular state senator named Jack Gordon, who was a, uh, a state senator and a banker. He uh, was a, actually a wealthy person. Uh, and uh, um, there, so there were some Jewish political heroes like that. that um, so, uh, but uh, if there was a Republican in the school, I didn't know about it. And we didn't know about it. So from there, you went to do your undergraduate work at Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, and this was 1964. It started in 64, yeah. 64, so during a period of sort of rising mm -hmm. social ferment among mm -hmm. American youth and mm -hmm. development of the counterculture, civil mm -hmm. rights mm -hmm. movement, Vietnam rising. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent were you involved with all of this? As, as I was involved with most of it, and uh, an interesting way that I started, or, or, or uh, when I got there, I wasn't. I, I figured I'm a re reformed Jew. Hillel looks to me like it. That that's my my home. So the first year, uh, first couple of years, I went to Temple Israel of Boston, and heard one of the great liberal sermonizers, Roland Gittleson, and. Uh, it would have been in 65 where he preaches a sermon. I think this is the last Rosh Hashanah sermon I'm ever going to give because he thinks the world, the Vietnam War is going to cause a nuclear conflagration and he's going, and he's going to orient his congregation to be uh, against the war in Vietnam. This was in the fall of 1965. So this, of course, is kind of continuous with what I grew up. I, what didn't surprise me, it kind of surprised me how powerfully he said it. Um, and uh, so again, it just, it's like continuity with what I was raised, that the Jews should oppose the war in Vietnam um, and uh, as Jews and as religious people. So I was pretty active, not, not in the more radical uh, Groups because they didn't exist yet at Harvard. The SDS hadn't been uh, hadn't been created at uh, at Harvard, but college Democrats, the young Democrats, uh, were fairly active and a, a good place for my activism. At the same time, I was connecting with the local Jewish community and actually did a sociology uh, uh, sociology of religion survey of the congregation about how much they supported uh, freedom of. The pulpit for their for their rabbi, um, so I was very interested in the Jewish community. Um, my roommates were uh, two half Jews and one Cuban Catholic who only dated Jewish women. So the issue of Jew religious identity, Jewish identity, ethnic identity were were things we talked about. We're still friends, uh, uh, and uh, so my Jewish identity was developing in response to the people around me. What role did Hillel play in, in the Hillel was theory? really a, a place where I could learn things. I, mean, I took modern Hebrew there. I, I rode my bike over on a Sunday morning to sort of learn spoken Hebrew, which this I had. This is on Bryant Street. Bryant Street. It was a ways. Uh, on the edge of the campus. Sir. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and the, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Hillel Colloquia seemed, was a very interesting program. I think I attended it every year. Um, so it was a place, uh, it didn't feel like a natural community to me, uh, I'm sorry. I had friends there, but it just, I, I, I was intimidated by the, the sort of the background of the folks who were there. Um, they was all there seemed to know of, more than me. Was there much of a reform presence in no. the Hill at the time? No, I mean, there, the, the, the president uh, who went then went to rabbinical school with me was Mark Rosenstein, but I didn't know him. And uh, the people I, I knew and cared about and thought were wonderful people, uh, uh, like Martha Acklesberg and Paula Hyman, I, I found them intimidating uh, uh, um, Jewishly. So you know, I, most of my career, I was a Hillel rabbi, so I was very aware of uh, you know, how, a, how a Hillel looks to somebody who, whose Jewish education is is less uh, less strong. Did so, you have a relationship with Rabbi uh, Ben Zion Gold? Not not really, because uh, I found Ben also uh, intimidating. But there was a sweet older Reform Rabbi, Maurice Zigman, Ziggy. Everybody called him. So I was close to to Ziggy, uh, and Ziggy 
wrote a reference for me for rabbinical school and so uh, and of course I became a big fan of Ben and loved him dearly the time that we spent in, in Hillel uh, and, and, and as professionals later. as professionals yeah uh, so during this during this period in the 60s um, Rabbi Gold wrote an article on religion um, on campus in which he said that faith in what he called civic religion was shattered during the decade, during that mm -hmm. decade of the 60s, mm -hmm. because of the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, and the mm -hmm. counterculture. And at the same time, he found that this period also saw a new pride in diversity mm -hmm. that celebrated different lifestyles and religions. Mm -hmm. How would you describe what it was like to be a Jew? Would you agree with that assessment? And what was it like to be Jewish on the Harvard campus at that point? You know, I didn't... Uh... I, I didn't think of myself in those terms as a Jew on the Harvard campus. I mean, I was very secure in my identity. Uh, uh, I volunteered at Phillips Brooks House. Uh, Phillips Brook House. Phillips. Phillips Brooks. Phillips Brooks House. Brooks. Yeah. Right. Um, and that was one of my expressions of my Jewish identity. I, I volunteered. Uh, a project at the mental hospital, visitors at mental hospital, sort of adjunct visitors. And I'd looked for, for kind of social service projects and did as much as I could as a political activist. Those were my Jewish outlets. Um, and many of the people who did those things were, were Jewish. And I noticed that. And, uh, and the Hillel for me was a place to learn, uh, deepen a little bit, uh, parts of my uh, Jewish knowledge. I took a few classes in Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish studies. Um, uh, I took a class, uh, a couple of classes with Isidore Ortorsky, uh, um, talk about intimidating uh, as a, a professor and person, uh, although I was quite fond of him. Uh, uh, um, he, uh, when I applied to rabbinical school, I asked uh, if he would write a recommendation for me, because it was the only really Jewish class I had, and uh, eventually did, but he said that the Jewish, because I was also pre-med at the time, I, was, I hadn't decided uh, to go to rabbinical school, um, and he said the Jewish community needs educated lay, lay people. It needs Jewishly committed doctors, so I'm not sure you should go to rabbinical school. <laughs> uh, um, so Israel, um was also catapulted into the forefront of people's consciousness. Six Day yeah. War happened yeah. Um, yeah. during your undergrad years. Yes, well, that was catapulted from nowhere in my case. Uh, that's, that's something else about the Southern Jewish uh, community and Reform community was profoundly non-Zionist except for a handful of, of uh, rabbis. So, and my rabbi wasn't one of them. So. One of the rabbis in Miami, with whom I was quite close, Leon Cronish, was the head of uh, Israel Bonds, and his son, Ron, Ron Cronish, and I were, were best friends all the way through high school. So I was at the Cronish family home for second Seder every year. So we only had one Seder. Um, so I was with my rabbi and congregation on the non-Zionist side of things, or as I thought about it, um, but the Six Day War had uh, a profound effect on, on a lot of us. Uh, uh, I, I, I had some obligations that summer, but Ronnie, Ronnie Cronish and I tried to volunteer if they would take shorter term volunteers. You had to be there at least six weeks or eight weeks, I don't remember. Volunteer in Israel. Israel, yeah. So we were ready to go. I, I actually was driving back from Boston with Ronnie, who went to Brandeis when the war broke out. So we're listening to it on the car radio and trying to figure out how we could volunteer. Um, so that was my first real uh, sense of connection. I just felt I should be there, but it was not from my upbringing and it wasn't particularly from any experience at, uh, at Harvard. Um, so most of the community that I was familiar with was uh, might have contributed money, but I would describe them as non-Zionist or even diasporanist. I mean, this this was our home. This, these our issues were social justice issues here, or uh, creating a, a warm community where people can observe. Uh, and Israel was not 
on people's uh, agenda unless they were raised in one of the movements, uh, the Habanim, Yan Judea, and a handful of friends like that, but uh, we never discussed it uh, in, uh, in high school. So would you say the Six Day War was a pivotal point for you personally in terms of your relationship with Israel? Yes, and, but, and completely unpredictably, and I just sort of, there was something in me that said, I, I, this, this is me. Uh, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it probably half an hour uh, in the rest of my life. I mean, it was, yes, there is Israel over there, and uh, I'm here, and there's plenty for me to do as a, as a, as a Jew in America. Um, yeah. I felt I, I, I certainly felt at home, and uh, if I, uh, and I had a mission. I won't say whether. Um, as, a, as a diaspora Jew, I was going to fulfill what Jeremiah thought I should do uh, and pray for the welfare of the city and act on it. On that, that. that was your sense of identity. Right, that was my sense of identity. Um, so how did and this... I did, and, uh, until I went to Israel for the first time, that, that really made a, a, an even bigger impact and also completely unpredictable to me from my for my background. I, I went between my first and second year of rabbinical school, I went to Ulpan Akiva in Netanya to improve my Hebrew, which I th thought was inadequate for what level of that I wanted to, to study. It was good enough for Hebrew in college, but it wasn't good enough for me, and so I, I, I took off that summer and went to an Ulpan, and that totally amazed me, a sense of connection to a place uh, because uh, it came out of the blue. I, what, what I wasn't prepared was for it. What year was that? That's like summer of 69. Summer of 69. Mm -hmm. So you graduated from Harvard in 68. Went directly to rabbinical school. You did. Uh, and uh, uh, my choices in 1968 were between Chavrat Shalom, uh, the, the RRC, which was just starting, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, and Hebrew Union College, which I've been oriented to my whole life, I mean, the reform movement. But I, just, I actively I just, considered the uh, Chavrat Shalom and uh, and the RRC. Why did you decide on rabbinical school as opposed to medical? Yeah, medical yeah, yeah, medical yeah. I I got into medical school. I continued my parents, uh, uh, and they didn't insist. It just what if I changed my mind? And I was pre med. I might as well apply and 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 take an acceptance. Uh, um, but. My experience of the 60s was very formative uh, in terms of going towards rabbinical school. Um, the anti-war movement, the sense that the society around me was, was collapsing, that my, my passion was uh, anti-war work and, so, and civil, civil rights, human rights, uh, and I didn't think that going to medical school and spending four years in a medical medical school and then a number of years in a residency, I, I could respond to what I thought was most important in the world and, and to me personally. So I was heavily influenced by Martin Luther King and William Sloan Coffin, two Protestant ministers. Uh, William Sloan Coffin was the chaplain of Yale and a passionate anti-war activist. And I heard him. I heard both of them speak in, in Cambridge and Boston, um, and they were they were uh, to me like Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, they were very inspirational people, and I, my rabbi was at a much lower level, but also was in the same ballpark of people speaking out against the war and organizing within the, the community. And I. So this was a very activist vision model yes. for a yes. rabbi. Right, right, and I thought the rabbinate, because my rabbi was like that, was a place where you could do that kind of work, um, um, connect powerful religious, historical, ethnic identity with the issues of the day. Um, and I thought that that's what I would be able to do even while I was in rabbinical school and then as a rabbi. Um, uh, so, uh, so Coffin, who I, I heard speak a number of times, um, was a chaplain at Yale at that point, then, then went to Riverside Church. So I also thought that the campus was a place, and one of, one of the reasons why I went into Hillel was, was uh, William Sloan Coffin as a, as a role model. Were but there, I didn't really think of that. When I started rabbinical school, I assumed 
I would be in a congregation someday and um, oh, as, a, as a medical one, mm -hmm. no, I, me I was a pre-med student. I, mm -hmm. My interest uh, was primarily in psychiatry. I was interested in the field of psychiatry and so I, I thought of ther becoming a therapist it was, was going to be my life work and I thought of the rabbinic profession, the extensive profession, as a combination of the things I was most interested in. Um, and as I said, my own Jewish identity was challenged, tested. Uh, I, I had to think about it all the time with my, with my roommates. Uh, uh, they, they, they were influences on me. Uh, my my half-Jewish uh, uh, roommate, Peter Millock, whose mother was Jewish and his father, both of his parents were anarchists, but uh, his father was an Italian immigrant who was so hostile to the uh, the church, uh, Roman Catholic Church, and uh, he, he's the only one of the people I was close to then who was dead set against my going to rabbinical school. I was kind of an elderly, uh, he was uh, even then in his 70s, uh, and uh, this passionate Italian anarchist, and he thought I was, I was wasting my time. <laughs> But he wasn't persuasive, ultimately. No, he wasn't. Uh, yeah. I, what I wanted to ask before was whether there were rabbinic voices during that period in the mm -hmm. mid-60s that were, uh, I mean, outside yeah. of your rabbi. Yeah. Well, age. as I said, the first person outside, and that's the first rabbi I really encountered as an adult, was Roland Gittleson, who was a, a great liberal. Turned out to be not so liberal on, on issues of Israel-Palestine, uh, although... I would, in his mind, I think he thought he was, but uh, but there were a number of reform rabbis who I, I, I knew of, and of course I knew about Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, I, I knew, I mean, I, the picture of him was in my mind. Uh, I hadn't read any of his uh, books at that point. Of course, his books were not, uh, at that point, there was probably nothing other than a handful of essays that would have been relevant anyway. It was his person and what he did. But I was quite aware of all the number of rabbis who, who uh, went to the south. A few of them did I know, but went to St. Augustine, which was in Florida. So that, when that happened in 1965, that was a uh, powerful lesson for me. So the, the activity, the action of rabbis, uh, and I wasn't particularly aware of the rest of the Jewish community, but there's certainly a number of rabbis who were active in, in civil rights. and I. Um, so they were collectively a strong influence on me. Yeah. During your college years, just to go back for a sec, were you, were you drawn to, to go to the South, sort of following in the footsteps of these rabbis to actually yeah. work on voter registration, participate yeah. in any so of I'd, the... I'd done that already in high school. Right. Uh, yeah. um, no, and I don't... Th there were a handful of folks around the seminary, particularly in Columbia, who, I mean, were so more directly connected there, and I know made it down there, several of my friends in the New York Habara, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, did that. Um, no, by that point, uh, I was, my activism was more anti-Vietnam War right. focused than, uh, than civil rights. Uh, so you were starting to say a few minutes ago uh, that you had some choices, at least in your mind, about yeah. which direction to go in terms of rabbinical yeah. school. Yeah, I had met Art Green my senior year and knew about Chavrat Shalom and uh, forming. It, 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 it started that year. New York Chavrat started the year afterward. And its first year, first couple of years, it was thought, it thought of itself as degree granting. They were going to give people a degree of Chaver, uh, but more relevant or, or also relevant at the time was draft deferments. So uh, they, you could study there, as you could in several yeshivas in Brooklyn, uh, go, go about whatever else you wanted to do, but you would get a draft deferment. Uh, now, I wasn't... Um, Which would have I, been true at RRC and... Yes, and Hebrew Union College and, and College RRC would have, well. would have qualified for that, as, as would a medical school. I mean, the two, I mean, I wasn't going to rabbinical school to avoid the draft, uh, but a number of my classmates were. I mean, my class in New York, uh, the New York School of HUC, started with 19 people and only seven finished. A lot of, lot of folks uh, uh, who were 
part of the uh, uh, anti-war movement and discovered that that was one of the ways they could avoid the draft. Some of them would have made great rabbis, but it's too right. bad. So you uh, actually applied, is that correct, to Chavarat Shalom? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I ultimately didn't apply. I mean, but I thought about it. I mean, it was still pretty in Kuwait, and I didn't really know the people. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd had a wonderful seder with uh, Arthur and Kathy uh, Green. That year? Yeah, in 68, 68, Pesach 68, when I was still making a decision. And they were just about to get off the ground. Right, that, right. That yeah, fall. they were talking about it. Right, that fall is when they started. So they were talking about it, and um, it just was a little too unconventional uh, for me uh, to make that choice. And the same thing with the RRC, uh, which looked very good on paper, but I would have been the first, with Michael Luckins, the first two students. He, he was the first student in, in 1968. Um, and uh, the, the one thing that I did do, and partly in response to all of this, was I, I decided to go to the New York School of uh, Hebrew Union College Rather than Cincinnati. Rather than Cincinnati, because Cincinnati was the classical reform, liberal, religious in a religious sense, school where my rabbi had uh, gone. And uh, I was convinced, partly by my you know, contact with people like Art Green uh, and the more traditional folks at Hillel, that I, I would be not a full, fully educated, fully involved uh, Jew if I went to Cincinnati, which too much like what I grew up in uh, in Miami. It was one particular rabbi who helped me realize that, uh, Dick Hirsch, who had gone to both Cincinnati and uh, the New York School. At one point they closed the New York School when Stephen Wise died, and he, so he had to go to Cincinnati to finish. And when, when did the New that. York School open? Uh, Stephen Wise started, well JIR was started, uh, I should know that, right? Yeah. More or less. even 1920. But it didn't merge with HUC until Wise died in the late 40s. And the people who didn't want to merge formed the Academy for Jewish Religion. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there were very different experiences being in Cincinnati and being in New York. And I chose to go to New York because I'd had enough connection with Kalal Yisrael and other forms of Judaism. That's a, Hillel was an influence in that, in that sense. I, I realized I, was, I had a a sliver of the Jewish community and I didn't in my background and, and I wanted to broaden myself. So it's part of my motivation for uh, joining the New York Havara, in fact the large part of the motivation, same motivation. So let's let's turn to that and your the uh, the beginnings of your involvement in the New York Havara, so which was formed as you just said in, in the fall of sixty nine. Mm -hmm. So What's your understanding of, of how and when the idea for this new community began to take shape and, and who was involved in yeah. those very well, my early Well, the history that I heard at the time was uh, there were, uh, John Ruskay was a rabbinical student, Peter Geffen had been uh, not accepted by the seminary. This is a rabbinical student at JTS. At JTS, yeah. So there was a group of rabbinical students or and graduate students around the seminary uh, who were sort of spiritually unhappy at the seminary was too confining, too, too straight, and they had a particular galvanizing event, which was uh, Burton Weiss, uh, who was a draft resistor, uh, had come to New York, and he knew these folks, I think, through conservative movement uh, contacts, and they set up sanctuary for Burton at JTS, they, as churches were doing for draft resistors. We are a synagogue, and uh, we're going to uh, protect Burton Weiss. So around that, they gathered and said, "This this place doesn't meet our Jewish needs. Uh, it's too stultifying. Uh, it's too rigid. We should form some uh, a collective uh, of our own." Um, I don't know whether they were in touch with the people uh, in Boston or not. Uh, but that was the nucleus around that sanctuary, I gather, from talking to Peter, Peter Geffen, John Ruske, Alan Mintz, the, who are, the, as far as I could see, the, the people organizing it, um, that we would f 
instead form a community um, that would also uh, have a serious study component. The people who wanted to increase their their study uh, their study and deepen their knowledge and. And in the beginning, once it formed, the first year, the New York Chavra also gave draft deferments. It was much more controversial within the Chavra. There are people who thought we should do this to save Jewish lives, uh, regardless of what, what, how serious we are. And other people who felt that uh, this was, we were, we were lying, we would be lying if we thought, uh, lying to the government that this is a serious seminary that, and people, um, uh, could get a serious degree here and would deserve a draft deferment. So there were there were conscientious arguments on both sides. Were but there... the first year, uh -huh. because we didn't, in, in Chavrat Shalom, they said you'll get a degree of Chaver. That was what the, the degree was going to be, which is uh, good enough as far as the government was concerned. Uh, the New York Chavera, the alternate seminary model was, we did it legally for a year and then it disappeared. That there was too much cognitive dissonance so around that it. that first year, 69, 70, and yeah. many, of the, many of the people who were involved were actually seminary students at, J at JTS. That's, that's right, the, or former. Uh, John, John dropped out and started graduate school at Columbia. Um, uh, and Mintz was, uh, Alan Mintz, there were two Mintzes. There's Mintz Allen and Mintz Lewis, but uh, uh, and uh, Alan uh, was working on his uh, PhD in English. That was his first PhD before his second PhD. Yeah. Um, so there, oh, he may have still been an undergraduate. The la the, uh, it was either senior or beginning. Uh, but it was, they were kids. I mean, 21 and, the 20, 21 and 22 year olds started the, the New York Habra. Were there faculty mentors? Um, Rabbi Eugene Weiner. Yeah, Gene, Gene was the was the mentor. I mean, the the, the member of the faculty uh, who was sensitive to the spiritual needs and the angst of uh, uh, people there. So he was a beloved mentor of those folks. He was a very very key person. So what was his role? Would you say in in this? He, the, well, some of this is before my time, but he right. was a mentor and a spiritual advisor mm -hmm. to to the individuals. The first meeting, I believe, the, well, there were organizing meetings all along, but we, we gathered on Shavuot in 1969 at Nyack, uh, Camp Ramon, uh, at Nyack. Back up for one second, tell me how you first became aware of yeah. these stirrings yeah. and, and, yeah. and decided to sort of get yourself involved. You were a first year rabbinical student at right. UGC right, right. at the time. So a couple of my friends, Ronnie Cronish and uh, uh, Keith Karnofsky, had somehow connected, Keith maybe because he went to Columbia as an undergraduate, had connected with this group of folks from the seminary, uh, and Mark Rosenstein, uh, and uh, so this very interesting group of people. This is what they're, they're planning this concept. Uh, um, and uh, you should you should come. You should be part of it. Uh, um, we, I don't think they had an agenda that there should be reform rabbinical students there. It was on, on a personal level that it would be very interesting. Um, but at that point, even though the chavra didn't exist yet, uh, uh, there was an admissions process. Um, so you had to be interviewed by. There was a core group. I, I don't even know who would have qualified at that time. But it was certainly at least John, Peter, and Alan. Um, and there were other folks, people who taught at the seminary or were doctoral students like David Sperling and Ruvain Kimmelman. Um, but I'm not sure at the, who, who was considered to be a member of the, probably the eight or ten people who were members, and they were going to admit others. So they, they, they were constituted as a Right. As a right. So, and are you saying they also had gone through whatever process was necessary legally to uh, be chartered as a seminary? By the time we started in the fall, there was a legal, definite legal document. Uh, John had a good, uh, John will tell you his name, but a, a wonderful liberal lawyer who died and passed away quite young and had done a help with the legal work. To, so we were constituted as a, as a uh, divinity school or rabbinical school capable of giving deferments, which we did for a year. 
So this was 69? Uh, it started in 69. Yeah, I don't know when. The, the, so the organizing ha was happening between 68 and 69 while I was a first year rabbinical student. So as, the first and, and meeting, as Chavarat Shalom was just, had just gotten off the ground. Right, right, okay. right. So it was kind of simultaneous and as far as I knew, completely separate. Um, and, and just started because of a group of people who convened around uh, Burton Weiss at the seminary. Right. Um, and, uh, but they were adding members. I don't know if they had an idea of how many they wanted, but uh, so you had to be interviewed. So what was that so process I, that was, for you? Well, it was uh, vaguely intimidating also. Uh, as it is Alan Mintz, who was one of the smartest, elo most eloquent people I've ever met, who I'm quite fond of. So Alan Mintz was a year younger than, than I, and he meets me at, at one of the Upper West Side, uh, uh, it's not a deli, it's like these little restaurants, uh, diners, like yeah. maybe even the, the actual one that Seinfeld uh, used, I think maybe. Uh, and so Mintz interviews me for an hour, two hours, I don't remember anything that he asked me. Um, and. I found it a little bit weird. Uh, I wanted to be part of the group. I mean, he wanted to know about me. I was certainly, uh, this was a, a pretty knowledgeable group, even though pretty young. Uh, and if they weren't, knowledge, they weren't knowledgeable, they were very smart. Uh, but most of them had, had very strong conservative movement backgrounds or, or even stronger uh, people like uh, Rufain. Uh, and here was me with my background and passions, but, but very little um, basic knowledge of Judaism. My Hebrew was pretty weak. I didn't know the traditional service uh, at, at all. I knew what I, what I grew you up with. Reform service. Right, right. So I was really a learner, and it was a, a, um, uh, a challenging experience. And, and uh, Mintz, I think, had already started. We, we call our, ourselves by our last names. I don't know why. Huh. Uh, and so he, he, had, he had already started uh, Response Magazine, and he was an extremely thoughtful and, and erudite and also very funny. Uh, and uh, so I, got, I was accepted. I don't know what the criteria were. On the basis of that interview with Yeah, with well, I knew people. I mean, I don't know whether they just want to, maybe it was, they were just checking out people's personal uh, affect, whether we would fit, because it was a, a fairly intense community, whether, you know, our, our personalities would, would uh, uh, meld acceptably. So uh, maybe that was part of it. I, I, I never found out. I never saw any... Uh, any uh, criteria, you'd have to ask the, the actual founders. Uh, I found it off-putting uh, also, and so I was on the side of open admissions by the time that that issue had been, was, it wasn't debated during the first year so much, but I actually, I left for two years. I spent two years in Israel. So I was a member of the Chavarov for its first year, and then I came back for its fourth year. Um, were there other people from the HUC sort of world who were also? There were there were four members? of us, four first year rabbinical students. Uh, so who were they? Ron Cronish, Mark Rosenstein, Keith Karnofsky, and me. I don't think. I think that was it. Uh, in when I came back, uh, one of the most wonderful acquisitions for all of us. Uh, I happened to, to study in the library uh, next to David Ellenson, uh, and David. So I thought David, David, having a small town Orthodox background and being completely lost at HUC spiritually, um, and um, I said, I, I've got a group of friends that you'll uh, enjoy, uh, and uh, David. I'm for all. I mean, David's a wonderful human being. Uh, and as I say that about a lot of those, those folks, but David particularly was a, a, a wonderful addition to because uh, uh, his background quite different. Uh, uh, he was a fellow Southerner and small town Orthodox and a brilliant scholar of uh, comparative religion and therefore also a brilliant scholar of comparative Judaism. Yeah. And so he had a perspective that that uh, the very strong 
uh, scholarly folks we had, like uh, Bob Goldenberg, uh, did, did, didn't have on, on the kinds of things we were interested in. So the original brochure for the New York cover art um, sort of described the, the vision. And yeah. what they said was, free from ties with other institutions, the Chavara will aim to create a new kind of religious leadership for the Jewish community and to serve as a model for a new form of Jewish life. What was the driving desire for a new form of religious leadership? Well, you could say uh, it was that descent from the uh, the seminary model. I actually don't remember that language. Uh, I'm, 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 I guess I saw that brochure because that 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 already um, sort of positions the rabbinical seminary model. Uh, you know, we're going to educate leaders. Um, we, we felt uh, by the time the, the Chavara was forming that we were uh, creating a new form or reimagining a form of, uh, of Jewish community as much as leadership. Uh, leadership was, uh, was not such a strong... Uh, uh, motive for the way we were structured. We were, I remember, I don't know if it's in that document or another document, that there would be uh, four pillars. Uh, that was, if it's very, you should daven together with the people you do political action together, with whom you socialize and with whom you build community. Those are the four pillars of the New York Havara. Um, and uh, so it would be an integrated uh, uh, community. And that, the communitarian focus of it was was stronger than the leadership development uh, uh, focus. And yet, um, much of the disenchantment of the original members, many of whom were, were uh, students at the at JTS, did focus on the JTS model of rabbinical rabbinic education. So, how would you describe the pedagogic approach mm -hmm. of HUC in mm -hmm. comparison? <laughs> I was a, a student, a, a very rebellious student there, because I thought the curriculum was was um, arbitrary. I mean, at least at seminary, the curriculum was describable. At HUC, it was uh, classes in history, classes in theology, classes in halakha. Uh, it was departments, and it wasn't rabbinic. I didn't think it was rabbinic education, and it didn't. It didn't have the strong core that JTS has, but that. That's from my, my perspective. Uh, so I thought the approach was dilettantish. You you could, you could speak well by the time you got out, but you didn't you didn't have an in depth knowledge or an in depth basis for, uh, for for speaking well to issues. So I, I thought the curriculum was underdeveloped. The the curric the the Chavara, the first year had classes, really wonderful classes, which completely. Uh, contrasted with my rabbinical school classes. Uh, David Sperling taught a class in Psalms. Ruven Kimmelman taught a, taught a class in, in effect, ethics, rabbinic ethics, but he was particularly interested in uh, uh, nonviolence in the Talmud, which he wrote quite a bit about uh, after that. Um, so he was testing out his what he would write about and, and teaching us uh, from sections in the Talmud that, that dealt with, uh, with human life and human rights, essentially. Um, so it was, and it was a small class of people who cared about each other and really cared, uh, um, not just that you could un uh, translate the Psalms and get into the head of the author, but uh, how might this uh, connect with your experience. Right. And certainly the, the issue of nonviolence was, and, and the war in Vietnam and whatever, so we were studying relevant text, but serious text study uh, was, was part of the Chavara and it continued to be the, the years that when it was a well-organized community, uh, text study in relationship to the, the world outside was to kind the of contemporary a world. Contemporary outside. world, yeah, yeah. Um, was uh, key to the, to the study component. We, we, we were consistent uh, in our shita and our system uh, on that. And uh, I would, when I thought about the uh, the three Chavarot, uh, including for Brengen, I always thought of Chavarot Shalom as the, the spiritual Chavarot and, and for Brengen as the political Chavarot and the New York Chavarot as the intellectual uh, Chavarot. Now that's gross uh, 
exaggeration and gross, gross stereotype, but uh, uh, the New York Havara was fairly traditional in its uh, davening, much more so than Havara Shalom or Fabrengen. Yeah, I want to come back to that yeah. in a minute. Um, uh, you mentioned um, Rabbi Eugene Borowitz mm. as a, as yeah. a mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a larger than life figure in, yeah. in, in the yeah. seminary, in the, yeah. in the Reform Seminary, enormous influence. Um, mm-hmm. um, what, what, what drew you to him and what kind of an influence did he have on your education, um, your rabbinical education? <clears throat> well, nothing really drew me to him other than his ideas. Uh, uh, um, he, he was a, a brilliant teacher of theology, comparative theology. I mean, a lecture that he gave on Buber would, could make you weep. But he also was a, a post-naturalist. I, I was raised uh, with a, an Orthodox rabbi, and I, the textbooks we had were written by Roland Gittleson, a lapsed Orthodox rabbi who became a reform rabbi. The textbooks were by Roland Gittleson, and Gittleson was a naturalist and a sort of reconstructionist, and that, that's, that's vaguely what I th- thought I was. If, what does a naturalist mean? Uh, that God is not, uh, uh, that God is imminent in the world and natural processes, the, the sort of Kaplan, uh, uh, so, yeah. so it, it's not a supernatural God, it's the God of ethics, the ground for ethics. Uh, and that was very congenial with the way I was raised, but it wasn't connecting for me. It was intellectually there. And Gene Borowitz, the freshman year, as a sort of introduction to the ranges of theology and people who I hadn't met, and I hadn't I hadn't read any Heschel. Uh, and so, I mean, he's explaining Heschel and Soloveitchik and uh, everybody all the liberals, and putting them in the, in the Kaplan and Leo Beck and whatever, so I understand who the people I grew up with, but I, I, I was deeply influenced by Borowitz's explanation of Buber and Rosenzweig. Uh, and that, that I, I felt intellectually excited and spiritually drawn, uh, and I didn't think the, the kind of reform worship that I grew up with was soothing, but it was not powerful for me. And, um, and that was this, uh, one of the reasons why I was very pleased to be part of the Chavara, and that's what I expected, and that's what I gained. Uh, as, com- uh, as traditional as our davening was, for me, it was a revelation. Traditional as the davening was in the Chavara? Yeah, the Chavara was kind of like straight conservative movement davening, by and large. Mm-hmm. With some nice guitar music uh, thrown in for for mood. Um, the intellectual side of it, the Ezra Nashim, which emerged out of New York Havara, that 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 was an incredible creative edge that was an unpredictable and wonderful blessing to us all. Um, yes. That uh, uh, and those are my friends, uh, and and so. Um, uh, they challenged us, and um, all of us grew from that, and all of us who were trying to relate to uh, a personal God, and still in our old uh, patriarchal models, and where we had difficulty, and uh, that, was, that was a revelation for, for all of us men, men and women, and that, that was part of the New York Havara. That was those, that, that Ezra and Hashim were mostly uh, New York Havara women. Uh, so we were uh, even though our davening wasn't wasn't the most creative, uh, uh, the ideas that that uh, we we played with uh, or we were challenged by uh, were were quite important. And so all of this, it sounds like, was com- complementary to everything that you were getting um, through your your rabbinic education at HUC, supplementing in a very profound way. Um, I learned much more from the Chavra than I did at, uh, yeah. from my friends in the Chavra than I did in rabbinical school. Yeah. There's no no question. Uh, even with the the, the inform, it just through the the, the dominating, I, I learned tefillah through the New York Chavra. Right. Um, so I want to um, I want to come to that in one sec, mm-hmm. but I I want to um, sort of start looking at sort of the the the, the pillars of yeah. of 
community and prayer, tefillah, social action, and, and learning. Right. Um, sort, of, sort of pull them apart a little bit separately. So many people point to community, this idea of community mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm. doing all of this in the context of mm -hmm. a community mm -hmm. as the heart of the Havara um, endeavor. Um, can you articulate what the vision for community was and how it would function um, within the New York Havara as it was getting off the ground? Well, this is the late 60s, so we had in mind a communalist and commune type ideas, even though we didn't ever think about living together. On the other hand, we, we spent every Thursday night together. So we cooked together and spent, not the whole night, but we gathered every Thursday night. This is in addition to Shabbat. We went away on a retreat once a month, which was really critical. So there we did live together. We, and most of them were, were sort of camp uh, public facilities where we slept in one room. Uh, Forty people, I mean, well, maybe not the first year, but we, we, we had these very inexpensive uh, sort of uh, state parks or whatever with a, with a retreat center. So we, we, we were intensely uh, bonding uh, on a regular basis. And that was important to us. Um, so it, it 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 was a it was a pillar. So that if you're studying something, you're going to know intimate details and intimate and have an intimate friendship with this group, which meant the size of the group was was significant. You couldn't do that with a hundred. You couldn't certainly couldn't do that in a shul. So the primary ideology of the Chavra movement, as far as I could describe it was small is beautiful, an intimate community. How large was that first group, to the best I think of your recollection? Maybe 20. In the first year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and some of the, that was a mm -hmm. fairly, it was less homogeneous than it came, became because there, there are a few people who were sort of creative artists who'd come in as semi-draft dodgers, but who knew people. And mm -hmm. so we, we and, and Ruvain, who was I'm, I'm not even sure what it is, a rigid Ruvain Kimmelman, but it was becoming quite from and quite orthodox, and uh, uh, even though he was studying at the seminary. So, and Sam Heilman uh, was part of the group the first year. So we had an orthodox contingent, or orthoprax contingent. Actually, it was quite pluralistic. You had yes, it was quite. You had reform, you had right, orthodox. Right, right, right. So, and that was also very important to us, uh, that, that we were we were post-denominational. So this was a deliberate effort on the part of the, the, the sure, founder I'm founders sure it was. I'm to sure reach it was. out to these different right. communities. Right, they, they were affirmatively recruiting uh, re uh, reform rabbinical students, I think. Um, when the New York cover up began, uh, they rented an apartment on West 99th Street. 98th, I think. Okay. One of those. One of those, 98th, 99th. Um, can you describe that, the space in which you were meeting? You know, the years? first year, oh, it's interesting, because the first year we didn't have an apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, we went from people's home. It was the mm -hmm. second year, I guess, the second. I, I don't know, because I was away. The very first Thursday night dinner was at my apartment. So uh, That's the, how it began? No, no. Well, no, yeah. we'd already had a retreat. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the Shavuot retreat. But the Nyack, you said. Nyack, yeah, but the first... Thursday night gathering, which was probably, I guess, in September, or maybe we started over the summer. I'm not even sure. Uh, maybe we started before the Shuot retreat, but we did not have an apartment the first, the first year. Where did we daven? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we daven in people's apartments, basically. Mm -hmm. So by the time I came back, Richie Siegel had uh, emigrated uh, from. Boston to New York, and he was in the Chavara apartment. So I, I don't know what year we acquired the apartment, because Richie was the first inhabitant, uh, mm -hmm. then mother, whatever, and uh, he, uh, so that would have been a year, and I'm, I'm not even sure it was not two or three years down the road that we had an apartment. So, so in the beginning, you were meeting in people's homes? People's so homes, sure. and that's where and that's where we davened. Uh, we didn't have any communal space. Um, I lived in the, the next uh, Chavra apartment. Uh, uh, 
from 74 to 77, and we had the apartment, I moved out to New Brunswick, but uh, we had a huge apartment at 102nd and Riverside, huge, as they say these days. But the, the, the living room, 100, 150 people could, uh, could be in that living room. Uh, crowded, but they could be. Where did the uh, financial resources come from to rent an apartment like that? Well, it wasn't that expensive, believe it or not. Uh, it was $750 a month, which I paid 250 because I lived there. Uh, and the original apartment was just a small apartment. I, I, I suppose we paid dues. Uh, I, I'm sure we paid dues. I, I don't. Uh, we. I'm. I'm. Imagine there was startup money. John had raised money. Uh, John, Peter, I don't know who to. But we didn't have any staff. Um, so we we must have had some dues that covered the apartment. Uh, the the Chavra apartment that I lived in had the Chavra school in it. Um, there was a school for neighborhood kids that particularly people knew uh, Paul Cowan and Rachel Cowan, uh, and they were uh, Rachel hadn't even had not even converted to Judaism yet, but they were raising their kids uh, Jewish. And Paul was an orphan in history, as he put it, and wrote about it beautifully. Uh, so we, we set up a school for uh, Paul and Rachel's kids and, and neighborhood kids who would fit, uh, who were, didn't fit into the uh, uh, established denominations. We would do something really creative. And that, that, that met in the, in the Chavra apartment. So you'd started to mention the regular Thursday nights. Regular Thursday night. The, uh, would not, you couldn't overestimate the, the impact of the retreats, though. Because that was an intense 25, 30 hours together once a month where we had to schlep everything up into the country, prayer books, whatever we were using. Um, they were, we, we did intensive study. That was where we did our best davening. Um, we talked about issues. I mean, it was, it, that was the, in many ways the core of the community were the retreats. It was a lot of effort. I mean, it's a lot of effort actually uh, to uh, to do this and get the food together and get away. But we we it was really important to us in terms of deepening relationships. Yeah. Um, what would the flow of the day be like? Uh, well, the Shabbat. I mean, from from Friday on. The, that's where we did our best davening. Kabbalat Shabbat it was it was a little bit more experimenting. Uh, some people ex experimented before Kabbalat Shabbat with traditions uh, related to uh, psychoactive substances which weren't legal at the time, but that was called Kiddush. That's how you would start the uh, Shabbat. I, I don't know where that custom came from, but others can describe it. So some people had a Kiddush before the Kiddush. That was something that we did in those days. Um, so that the Kabbalat Shabbat davening sometimes outside, if the weather was good, uh, um, uh, combined with it, we, we also always did a Sukkot and Shavuot retreat. And Sukkot, because it was a little longer, and we built a sukkah and Shavuot, we were an all-night uh, tikkun leil Shavuot. So um, th those were really, really strong. Th those were our strong suit, I, I think, were, were retreats and communal experience like that. They were, in many ways, the glue. That yes. Yeah. Really yeah. Created the bond for right, the community. That, right. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, making a meal for each other uh, every Thursday night. I mean, you know, alternate who would cook, who's who's how. So, so there, there there was a small community that cared enough about each other to feed each other and that, that sort of thing. So uh, that, but that, that was a it was a standard Shabbat. Uh, we'd uh, we'd uh, you know have davening and at the, all the appropriate times. I borrowed a Torah from one of the Hillels. I'm not sure if we had it the first year, but the Chavrat uh, Sefer Torah was uh, borrowed from a Hillel that wasn't using it. Um, and uh, we all we played sports in the afternoon. We played, we hiked, we played Scrabble using a Sidur to mark the score that everybody and, you know, you could say where you were in Tsukai de Zimra rather than what your score was. Uh, so that was that was a regular thing. Uh, Scrabble and 
and sports in and the afternoon. Right. And have the law and return. Sounds intense and very uh, yeah. empowering. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so, so to, the fact that we were a small group face to face, I mean, everybody knew everybody. Uh, and we, you know, felt uh, Heschel was writing uh, at the time, uh, uh, looked askance at suburban congregations. People don't know each other. They're there for, to, for an education for their kids, but they're not committed to each other. I mean, we, we were uh, going back to the idea of a model. This is what the Jewish community should be, what we are. Uh, we, we were that impertinent or uh, self-centered or whatever you want to say, but, but I do think that our, our, the sort of characteristics of the Chavara spread and they could be uh, the larger synagogues who who'd caught on to the, the intimacy uh, elements of it started forming Chavarot within congregations. Were there um it sounds like most of the people who were involved, if not all, were were um, single, if not, or, or married without children. Yes. Um, there there were, weren't yes. many children. Or right. Many the children. first year, uh, I think that uh, Sharon Sperling was born already in the first year, but uh, maybe not. Most of the people were single. A couple, I, 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 if, if there was a child, it was Sharon Sperling. Uh, um, so, and when, but then David Ellenson joined and had, well, he had one child, Ruthie. So at the beginning there were very few, if any, children. Yeah. Right. Then there were also very few, if any, women. Uh, right. There was only one woman who was an actual member. And that was? Liz Colton. Mm -hmm. uh, Phyllis Sperling participated. She was married to David Sperling. Um, I don't remember if anybody else was. Were there other some, sort of partners of members or spouses not of the members who were involved in the, the weekly uh, the communal meals or in the retreats? Um, there were by the fourth year. By the fourth year, we did admitted women that, that happened while I was away. So women were members on their own, but that was an issue. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there are people who thought of it somehow as a. I don't know, some kind of uh, cloister or something where... The women, a male women, club. Male club, yeah. In the beginning. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. And it sort of... Liz, Liz was grandmothered in and nobody else. Uh, How did she come to be a member? In this? She was a fr good friend of Alan Mintz. That's, I think I think that's the only reason. I mean, she was knew a lot of the folks. Uh, um, there was a... The strong core were... JTS conservative movement and Camp Rama in uh, the uh, in um, the Palmer Camp Rama mm -hmm. and some of the sensitivities and lit liturgical creativity such as it was came from Camp Rama and Palmer where I think Zalman had taught a, a once and mm -hmm. um, but there so the other other people were sort of uh, uh, we were recruited in the first year. Can you tell me a little bit more about the, the, the role of these, the, the weekly communal meals? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for one thing, the New York Havara was also known, at least to some, as the place where there was the good food, the best food. Yeah, the, well, people, yeah, people, uh, only a few people were good at it, but yes, uh, people, people cared. I mean, it was a re religious, I mean, it was a religious meal that, that, in that sense. Spiritually, we expected to 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 be able to really uh, enjoy that time together, and and people would take a lot of care. I remember Murray Pomerantz cooking in my kitchen, but he'd gone down to the 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 fish market and brought this enormous bluefish uh, I'd never seen. That my family didn't eat fish that much, and that was the first dinner. That was quite spectacular. Um, and uh, now to think of it, uh, uh, there was one other spouse, Alan, Alan Sugarman and Shira, who was, uh, uh, were, were a married couple in the first year. So as far as I recall, those were the two spouses. And if Sharon Sperling was born 
I think it happened yeah. the second year or something. So would people cook communally, or the, someone would host? Well, each at that point, there was some, well, I hosted, but I didn't cook. So that's what I mean. Yeah, you didn't so, cook so, in no, your own, yeah, you yeah. Didn't cook in your own kitchen yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so it, it, it's something a, a potluck, but a really high quality potluck. Uh -huh. And so, how would those evenings go? What tended to? Uh, then somebody would lead a discussion. There would be a theme, so it wasn't just getting together. We discuss an issue or a text, study. Um, Were these meals the the occasion for sort of informal community meetings? Yes. In addition to. Definitely, uh, and yes, and where it would have discussed, that, that, that would have been the place uh, where we would have discussed how are we going to expand, how do we bring in members, I'm sure there were, or do we want to bring in members, because I do, I mean, I remember the discussions about women being members, and that would have had to have been that first year, and I don't remember, uh, by the time I came back, uh, I, there was an avid discussion about whether we should have open admissions hmm. um, and uh, arg uh, arguments, uh, very strong opinions on one side or the other. And how did that go? Well, they were contentious, but it was the, the points because they were really, uh, um, uh, the, the points were valid and hard to square. I mean, so we have an intimate community because we, ha we had a rule that if one person uh, didn't want you, then that was it. We had a blackball uh, possibility. And I thought that was, I mean, personally, I thought I was offended by it. It's like a sorority or fraternity. But we were an intimate group, and if somebody had a pre existing relationship that was really challenging, uh, that could affect, and that was, that was the rationale. I mean, you'd get somebody in, and then the person who was, who's been a, a Haver, Havera from the beginning, is going to feel uncomfortable, and uh, it it took a, a little bit of uh, exercising that rule, which happened once or twice before people couldn't couldn't tolerate it anymore. And then we then we didn't have the blackball principle, and we moved to a s sort of a form of uh, open admission. I mean, there had to be some idea. People still had to apply, but there had to be a sense of compatibility. Um, uh, somehow, uh, you'd have to ask the people who were really there from the beginning, but there was a sense you weren't smart enough, you weren't together enough, that, that there was some cri uh, uh, criteria by which you could be rejected. And uh, I was an open admission guy. I mean, people with strong interest and passion who were willing to, to take on the same mission um, we, we uh, ought to be open to them. So you were on the losing end of that Basically, proposition yes. in the beginning? Of yeah, oh, definitely at the beginning. I mean, that only happened gradually over years. Uh, but the Thursday night, uh, getting back to the question, we would have discussed it on, on Thursday night. And was it a consensus model for decision-making? Yes. yes, definitely consensus. That's part of that same. This as a membership would be. You, you really want to bring everybody along. Um, there, there were different priorities. Uh, I'm not sure when in that conversation we'll get to it, but uh, the, the, one of the most interesting episodes uh, happened the first uh, November of the Chavara, November 15th, 1969. Well, there was one time in the Chavara's history where the diversity was very, very clear from the beginning, but it, was the, it wasn't a, so much that we disagreed but priorities, November 15, 1969, which uh, some people my age will immediately uh, relate to, was the time of the MOB, the National Mobilization Against the War in Vietnam, which was a weekend, including a Shabbat, uh, in Washington, um, and hundreds of thousands of people were expected in anti-war action, and we were uh, po strongly opposed to the war, but there was a Jews against the war in Vietnam that uh, uh, sort of come out of the New York Havara and the other Havara also. But at the same weekend, the GA, the General Assembly of the Jewish Welfare Funds, was meeting in Boston. And there was scheduled to be a strong student contingent of people led by Hillel Levine to argue for more funds going into Jewish education. 
but ve in a very rebellious way. Like you, you can't put money into hospitals that are just Jewish in name only and all these other wasteful things. Jewish education and, and funding for students should be a higher priority to Federation. So of course we were interested in that too, uh, but uh, like three quarters of the Chavra went to uh, Washington to participate in uh, the, the MOB, and one quarter went up, uh, Alan Mintz was the part of the group that went up to Boston to be with Hillel Levine and interrupt, I mean it was a demonstration at the, the Jewish Federation's gathering. We were in Washington uh, marching all night on Shabbat, there was a march against death, we, we had a service, we all stayed in my sister's apartment in Georgetown, about 30 of us on the floor, uh, and uh, had, had Kabbalah Shabbat, and then walked over to, I don't know how we got to the Pentagon, but once you were at the Pentagon, you walked, this is Friday night, all night long, walking from the Pentagon past the White House, depositing a name of a, uh, of a Vietnamese village in a basket, shouting the name, putting it of a village that had been destroyed, and then finishing uh, the march, called the March Against Death. The next day was the demonstration on, on Shabbat during the day. Um, there were all kinds of uh, Fabrengen or uh, proto-Fabrengen folks that are organized in, uh, in Washington. J -J. Yes, yes, oh. Jews for Urban Justice, yeah. Uh, and uh, so it was an incredibly powerful Jewish experience, a Shabbat, and bonding for, for us because it was November of the first year of the Chavara. Uh, and, and, and here was this other bonding experience going on at the same time. So we had very broad uh, interests uh, within the Chavara. We were, I, again, I was contrasting uh, New York Chavara with the other Chavara from my, from my perspective, just my perspective. We were much more focused on the Jewish community. Uh, um, the, uh, we were close to the rabbinical schools. Uh, we were interested in the Federation. We were interested in a, in a model for the Jewish community. Um, Ezra Nashim turn to the conservative movement, we were interested in how the movements developed, uh, how we could influence them. Um, so I, I would say that that was a different a cultural difference or an interest, a difference of interest uh, between the, the original three uh, Chavarot. Was there a discussion at the at communal weekly meals about which way to go? I mean, how were the oh, yes. made? Oh yes, yes, yes. I mean, we. We didn't have to disagree. Some people were going to to Washington, and some were going to Boston. Um, and of course, some of us thought, well, how could you spend a week and when this is happening in Washington? I mean, personally, we felt that way. Didn't argue that way. Why would Why would you argue? Uh, it was obviously worthwhile what they were doing in Boston. But we were, you know, some of us. The the, the anti-war movement was was the most passionate thing we cared about uh, uh, at that point in our lives. So. Uh, so these and there was a Jewish component to it. The fact that you, uh, there would be a strong Jewish Shabbat component to what was happening uh, in Washington was very important. Did, did um, the Chavara contingent and JUJ, the, your hosts there in, in Washington, did they, uh, were they also part of a larger Jewish presence at the, at the MOB? There was, there were, uh, we didn't combine, I think. There was, um, there were programs, but we, we did our own thing, as I recall. Uh, there were later demonstrations, uh, out in Kent State, Cambodia, I think, where there was more organized inter Havara cooperation or knowledge about what, what they were doing. So I, I may be con uh, conflating events there too. There was also a Jewish uh, component. Everything, all these things would end up being on Shabbat. So that was an issue for some people in terms of travel and, and being within walking distance. I mean, even, uh, people felt this was a wonderful way. Those of us who were Shomer Shabbat, including myself, uh, as long as we could walk to the demonstration, didn't bother us. We'd daven wherever we davened and we'd, we'd, we'd deal with it. Um, but we, there was also a small Jewish uh, component at the counter inaugural in, uh, of Nixon in 73. I remember meeting Arthur Waskow uh, on Capitol Hill near the, the Washington Monument where he's passing out almonds and raisins and 
sort of uh, uh, yippy type fashion, dancing all over and uh, wishing everybody a good Shabbat and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, what was the impact of having on, on the cover of having participated in these events, particularly mm. the Mo? Yeah, very very strong. I mean, that's why the, the, something emerged uh, as Jews against the war in Vietnam. I mean, I would, in a sense, I was, that, that's what I grew up, uh, an organized Jewish community being involved in, in uh, issues like that. And of course, Heschel was a big model and big influence on folks. Uh, and Dr. King had, before just uh, the last year before he was assassinated, come out against the war and gotten into a lot of hot water for it. Um, the Jewish community, um, the liberal Jewish community was opposed to the war, but there was already some uh, blowback from Israel about being visible as a, as a Jewish community against the administration. American uh, administration. Yeah, the American administration. Uh, being visibly identified as Jews against the war in Vietnam. I had, uh, this is, a, that year would that have been? No, no, it was 1970. 1970. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin had just been appointed the ambassador, and there were a bunch of us at the back of the rabbinical at the rabbinical ordination, wearing white armbands and passing out literature for Jews against the war. And Rabin came up to me and said, uh, "I don't remember if it was in Hebrew or in English. I think it was in Hebrew, because uh, his English was very poor when he started out as ambassador." He said, "Why are you? Why aren't you?" Uh, demonstrating for Soviet Jewry, which we were. I mean, one, one day of the week we were doing that, and another day we were Jews against the war in Vietnam. And uh, I, I sort of tried to explain that to him, and he said, this is not, it's not good for Israel, he said to us. To, for, to, for you to be demonstrating against the war in yep. Vietnam? As Jews. As Jews. And, and the, so, uh, um, so, that's an anecdote, uh, but in terms of the Chavra, uh, we were 60s people and progressives and anti-war, and to be able to do it in that context was very, very powerful. And I think all of us, was a, a, it wasn't life-changing. We were already in that space in our lives, but uh, um, it, it felt so wonderful to be able to be there with our very close Chaverim even though some of us had only known each other for three or four months. Yeah. And when you came back to New York, you're saying there were activities that grew oh, out yes. of this. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, uh, I mean, things were better organized out of Washington. They had uh, trees for Vietnam. And, but we, we, would, we uh, participated in protests. We formed something called Jews Against the War in Vietnam. I don't remember the institutions. There was, there was a project called the National Jewish Organizing Project, which came out of JU, JUJ and Verbrengen, but had an impact. There were programs. We had an anti-war demonstration. I don't remember what, it was on 55th Street, and uh, Marjorie Guthrie spoke at it, spoke, spoke about Arlo's Bar Mitzvah. At a, and the Chavara was part of the organizing of that. So. Mm -hmm. Mostly in coalition. I mean, we weren't uh, wherever the reform movement already was strongly uh, opposed to the war. Um, Rabbinical schools were also so it was. We weren't isolated in the Jewish community. Um, I also understand that some members got involved in creating something called Jews for Peace. Um, in the aftermath of the mobilization in Washington, that uh, Peter Geffen operated a branch from the Park Avenue Synagogue. Well, that may be what I'm thinking of, Jews for Peace. Jews for Peace. Jews for Peace in Vietnam. I, Maybe, yeah. That, that, that's yeah, it. That's probably what the it same was. thing. Yeah, I'm, that's just that's the nomenclature. Right. Yeah, I mean, Jews against the war, that, that wouldn't have been. Yeah, Jews that's, for uh, Peace, yes. Jews for Peace, that okay. was, yes. Okay, and then you worked also with some kids. Um, oh, I did. Yes, yeah, I did. Where, where I, I worked uh, in a in a temple in uh, Reform Temple in Forest Hills in Queens, uh, and the kids uh, were totally into doing anti-war stuff. Partly just because it was cool, and they saw college kids doing it. But they they did a a, a service, beautiful service, 
with all kinds of poetry and spirituality. Just, I was so proud of these. Uh, this was my junior youth group, and there were a couple of uh, powerful supporters of the war in the congregation. They just uh, fired me on the spot, and other people were as the, the advisor of these kids. Uh, uh, but I was leaving the next month anyway, and the people were. <laughs> The people, the parents of the kids were so proud of their kids and so excited about the work they were doing and how engaged they were through the temple uh, that they would even create an anti-war service for our Friday night service with Jewish elements that, uh, that, that sort of, hey, don't listen to him. You got to stay here for the next month and a half. So many of us were teaching uh, in various synagogues. Uh, whether we were rabbinical students or not, uh, the people were in demand as teachers in, in schools. And, and Peter had a strong connection with Park Avenue Synagogue, where a number of Chavarah members taught over the years. Yeah. So it was definitely a way of sort of extending the impact mm -hmm. out into the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, uh, I want to talk about tefillah, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll take a break. Okay. okay. So. Um, Uh, you, so you were starting to describe uh, Tfilah and saying that it was relatively conventional uh, mm -hmm. style of davening mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there. Um, Very little different, I think, from what you would get in a, in a conservative synagogue. Participatory. The, the big thing was completely participatory. I mean, it wasn't somebody leading and nobody following. Um, I'm trying to remember what Sidor, we, what, what Sidurim, what choice did we have? We probably had the Silverman Sidor, the standard uh, conservative movement Sidor at that time. There weren't creative Sidurim, there wasn't a Reconstruction Sidor, I don't think we would have used it anyway. Um, or would would um, Shabbat services take place on a regular basis or irregular in, the, in, the, in those early years? I think it was right. once a month because people had other, other commitments. I, I, my memory is not so clear and not so powerful. Uh, so my guess is the retreat and one other Shabbat a month we had services. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, um, and the Chagim, and the, the, we also did the, the uh, Yamin Norim, and those were very, very strong, especially once we had my, the apartment that I was the then mother for, uh, could fit 150 people. I mean the, 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 the apartment Chavra itself, the Chavra apartment, yeah. So the when we had so that apartment, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that was even further, it was, that was Chavra. further, it was 74, so, uh, well, it started in summer, yeah, five years. Mm -hmm. um, and then, at that point, we had a regular minion in the Chavra apartment every Shabbat. That became the West Side minion on the Upper West Side. It started at the Chavra, and then moved from the Chavra over to uh, West uh, to um, uh, Anshe Chesed on West End. Uh, but once once we had a, uh, that apartment anyway, which was large enough, and maybe with the first Chavra apartment at Richie's, we, we might well have had uh, davening every every week by that point. But early on, it was more. I'm pretty sure it was one. Frequent. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, many people talk about the the um, creative tension between um, tradition and innovation mm -hmm. as characteristic mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent was that true in the New York? Humber yeah, the, um, most of the innovation was really supplemental poetry or. Uh, 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 after the first year or so, guitar, you'd play, you know, we, we would start Chakrit on retreats with Morning is Broken, uh, Cat Stevens, we, uh, Beatles songs, uh, um, uh, that what we thought of as spiritual music from our culture, we integrated into the service and poetry. I remember the very first year, it's not davening per se, but I remember a discussion when we one of our first uh, ret retreats, if not the first, uh, Ruskay, John Ruskay, we'd, we'd have a safer tar, we'd lane, 
uh, or if we didn't yet, we, we, we uh, read from a Chumash, but then it came to the Haftarah, and the, 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 the Haftarah is a ritual, but its meaningfulness is not so clear to us in, in this day and age. Um, it, they're somewhat arbitrarily uh, chosen. Uh, some of them are edifying and some of them are gruesome. Uh, so John says, why don't we have something else for uh, uh, Haftarah? I mean, the concept, let's find a short story or a poem um, that relates to the Torah portion, take the institution of a Haftarah and do something different with it. So on that level, we, we, which isn't davening per se, but what, what happens during davening, we were ready to question from the very beginning. Um, but I don't, I don't think uh, tefillah was our, uh, was our strength. Uh, we had some beautiful daveners uh, after the first year. Richie Siegel himself was a gifted uh, Baal tefillah. Uh, but we, we didn't have a lot of gifted uh, uh, Baal tefillah, for one thing. And we didn't, until Ezra Nashim started advocating, we weren't so conscious of the... Uh, uh, the, the male bias in the tefillah, in, in the prayers themselves, and the structure of it, and what we did, how we did it, how we sat, that what we did, the informality was something that was important, and that in its own way was uh, uh, revolutionary or different. Um, uh, anybody could lead. We, we sat in a circle. We sat on the floor. If, uh, we pref uh, preferred sitting on the floor. We had some Facing, in a sort of in circle, a circle. Facing each other. yeah, facing each other. We had some peculiarities that I still I, I wonder about. We we were so intent on our davening that for some reason we it was a New York Chavra custom. I don't know if the other Chavra to not stand for the baruch hu. You just never moved. We were late, and maybe we were lazy, but we kind of like <laughs> bowed in place rather than standing. That was that was just what we did, or or for any of the. Uh, the various uh, Kaddish prayers. I don't think we stood for anything except the, the, the Kaddish Atom, Mourner's Kaddish. I think that was our own, the only time we, and, and for Tefillah itself, where we would tend to walk around, particularly if we were in the, uh, out, outdoors, people did their own Tefillah. So there were, there were stylistic things, but not so much a change of liturgy. That I associate much more with Chavrat Shalom, where I was amazed, uh, even from the very beginning, how different it could be and how creative it might be. And it, and it began to get even more creative once they integrated feminist um, theology and, and new prayers. So the Chavara was pretty, pretty uh, traditional in that way. What about music, the role of music? Yeah, it wasn't. Kalbach, um, no, we sang, we sang, but uh, it, we, we sang from the very beginning, and the Karbach music that was conventional we, we used, but it, it wasn't this sort of, particularly on Shabbat, sometimes on retreats, uh, the space kind of intensified what we were doing. And I remember we would move more, we maybe even dance a little bit. Uh, and mo mo so those were much more powerful once we got away from the city so I'm, I'm remembering sort of more movement and dancing and passion uh, when we were away on retreat, and that's probably why they were so powerful for us. But uh, getting together on a standard Shabbat, it, it wasn't, there weren't a lot of creative uh, uh, Baalei Tefillah or people who, who thought of liturgy as the place to innovate until, until Ezra Nashim came in or emerged. And that influenced what we prayed, but not so much how we prayed. Right. It, didn't, so, it took a while. I mean, the, 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 the Rosh Chodesh thing, I mean, they were doing really creative elements that could have been brought back into, into Shabbat in some way, or Thursday night, uh, if we daven in Mariv. But, but it, it, it just wasn't our, we, we weren't a, a creative edge uh, place there in, in New York. Um, Art Green characterized this moment, 68-69, found when, yeah. when uh -huh. both Chavra Shalom and New York Chavra were founded as a sort of pre-feminist moment yeah. in a lot of ways. And yes. Changes yeah. happened over yeah. the next several years, but 
the right. clothes woman was right. many people have talked about the fact that they weren't even particularly cognizant of it. They weren't even thinking about it particularly. I don't think it came up. It, it came up. Well, no. I mean, we were ready to exclude women for the, for membership. I mean, we just it, it just in, in no way had, did it come up in the uh, in, a, in any kind of strong way uh, in the first year. So were women um, were there women present for Tfilot? Yes. Oh, yeah. Even in yeah, the yeah. first year? Oh, yeah. Besides Liz Colton? Yes, uh, Liz. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I, I don't remember Phyllis being such a daviner. Uh, uh, so some of it was just personal proclivity, but uh, yeah, sure. And people did bring girlfriends and boyfriends. I don't remember the first year. Maybe we didn't have any yet. Uh, we should have, but we by 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 but by the fourth year, people brought uh, friends uh, and close friends and boyfriends and girlfriends, and the, the retreats were was a more extended family uh, uh, experience by the fourth year when I was was there. Early on, did women? Do you remember any women who were there ever having a public role? Is there any issue about Kolisha? No, there was not, not an issue like that. But that, but, and I don't think there would have been even from the, the firmer end of the spectrum. But th it didn't happen, so I, I can't, I can't mm -hmm. be sure. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I got back, uh, I, I'd say uh, my classmate and dear friend Martha was sort of the leader of the Chavara. The leader of the Chavara, clearly in the first year, where there was really the triumvirate of. Uh, Peter, John, and Alan. By the time I got back, if there was a president of the Chavara, which there wasn't, but the, the strongest leader was Martha. So there was uh, strong female leadership in the, in the whole structure of the Chavara, and certainly in, in the prayer service by then. So by then, yeah, you're talking was, about 74, right? No, 72 already. Was, okay. I came back in 72. Oh, 72. Seventy-two. So, so Ezra and Hashim had just been formed, right? But the, the but somehow year. between the, in the first three years, the, the women were leading davening when I, I came back and were clearly part of the the, the community. It happened while I was gone, right. okay. um, but but I think partly from their experience of leading and feeling empowered, people like uh, Paula and Martha uh, and Arlene Agus, who was on the periphery of the Chavara, she was a fellow traveler, uh, you know, they, they were allowed in, but they were leading uh, the same service uh, and, uh, and were excluded by the liturgy. I mean, that's, that's sort of, that's yeah. a superficial, and in some ways, superficial to add the imahot, but when you first do it, it doesn't feel superficial, it feels revolutionary. Um, uh, but we never moved, as Chavrat as, uh, Shalom, or at least at a, at a certain stage, Started adding the imahot. Well, what about the God language? What about the uh, the rest of the Hebrew? I mean, are, uh, oh, the but gendered I don't. Language. Yeah, the gendered language yeah, that didn't uh, have much echo in the New York Havra, which meant we didn't take the liturgy as seriously as we took the text and the the lived experience of the Jewish community. Whereas the other com the other powerful communities were much more intentional and focused on the liturgy. We were. Concerned about egalitarianism, but not so much liturgy. That, that's you my were, observation. You were uh, a rabbinical student at HUC, mm -hmm. not at JTS. So Sally Priestand was she, ordained in '72. Right. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, we also didn't. Uh, did, he, 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 I mean, the, in some ways, the reform movement didn't didn't add didn't add the Imahot, although that's not the most important thing to the latest version of its prayer book. Um, so the Wait, reform that, movement was. That, you mean when was the latest? Yeah, the Mishkan Tefillah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there was an in-between step, uh, uh, but uh, so the reform movement was just as slow as the conservative movement. It all it did was ordain uh, female rabbis, but it had no impact. The first feminist rabbi, uh, who I, I, who was my very close friend then and still is, Laura Geller was the third rabbi ordained. If she'd been the first rabbi ordained, th things might have moved a little differently. She was a fellow traveler, if not a member of the Chavara for the couple of years uh, that uh, she was in New York. Uh, so what, what year was she ordained? She was ordained in 76. So, um, 
so between 73 and 76, she was a fellow traveler of the Chavra, but she was a, a strong feminist. Sally was a lovely person, wasn't a feminist, didn't define herself as a feminist, and, and wanted to make sure that people weren't threatened by being the first. I mean, it's, it's, I have great sympathy for Sally and great affection for her, but she wanted people to know that she was as, just like any other rabbi, but she wore a dress. Um, she wasn't going to change the liturgy. She wasn't there to make waves. The second rabbi didn't really, uh, the second woman ordained, just didn't to actually take a job in the Jewish community. And um, so, so the, the reform movement in some ways was behind the conservative movement and certainly the reconstructionist movement in, in taking uh, feminism and the ideas of feminism seriously. So did the, um, did the attitudes within the, the reform movement or, or reconstructionism have any, as they were evolving, have any sort of direct impact on the early uh, ways in which pilot happened um, within the Chamorra? I think it's much more the other, in the other direction. The, the, the beginnings of Jewish renewal had an impact on the reform movement and the reconstructionist movement uh, uh, so that the sensitivities and, and the creativity and, and the change of language you had Joel Rosenberg translating the uh, uh, deeply influenced by Chavrat Shalom so his influence influenced the way liturgy developed in the reconstructionist movement Kaplan Mordechai Kaplan was a naturalist and focused on ethics and and removing prayers that seemed ethically offensive, um, and the the, the so I, it, it's definitely the other way. And I I can't think of any particular way that the reform movement uh, uh, influenced uh, the chavra. I mean, some of us from the reform movement had great social justice passion because that's what we it, we even it was called prophetic Judaism at a certain point, but that. Um, but so did our friends from the seminary and, uh, and our Orthodox friends. I mean, we that wasn't maybe, translating. Into, no, it wasn't translating. It was, per, you know, the sort of emphasis of some you know, special specialization or something, but not the reform movement per se or its ideas, because um, the the people who were influencing the cover people like me and and David Ellenson were Jean Jean Borowitz and uh, who was a strong progressive uh, uh, liberal. And so, and completely uh, uh, not um, influenced by Heschel uh, also. So there was this sort of cross pollination. Do you, pollination. When you came back from Israel in 72, do you uh, recall what it was like for you to experience women taking new roles and in public worship? Uh, it didn't. Uh, because I, and partly because I knew the two of the, the the strongest leaders, Paula and Martha, were were friends, not close friends, so they became close friends from college. So, it, it I found it liberating and positive, and I didn't find it strange. I, I don't know why I didn't, because there there were no rap, no female rabbis at the time, other than Sally, who had just been ordained. Uh, but it it didn't. I don't think it changed the dynamic of the community other than I, I, what, I mean maybe I was thinking more than feeling but uh, ideologically I was very pleased it's not an old boys club it, it's part of the egalitarian moving in an egalitarian direction which I I, I felt the Chavra should do anyway I was an anti-elitist in my thinking about the way it should be I and mean, we're going to be this powerful community, no, we've got to influence the community and we have to look like them more. I mean, I had reasons, intellectual reasons, but I didn't, I, I found it only liberating. As we were discussing at the beginning, the New York Havara was uh, founded and grounded in what uh, Meredith Wucher called the, the nexus of political and religious values, mm -hmm. which sounds like it was a continuation in many ways of the social justice activism that you mm -hmm. had imbibed over the course of your, your childhood and youth mm -hmm. at home. Um, what had been your experience, if any, as a Jew in, in sort of the general social movements of the time? Um, 
outside of Jewish context. Yeah, well, that, that's interesting. I mean, maybe a, a selective uh, attention, but you know, if you look at the civil rights movement, the, the percentage of uh, of whites who were Jewish was pretty high. And the same thing, uh, the anti-war movement and the early organizing for SDS. So the, the Jews always seem to be very prominent in, in the social movements. But not always feminists. acting Not always as Jewish Jews. Well, that's, yes, that's Jews. right. That's, that's certainly right. And, uh, uh, but, but within a Jewish framework. Right. You know, so that is, that is something that we felt, uh, the New York Havara felt very strongly about, and I personally uh, felt uh, was uh, something that was important to do, not simply be a Jew, but be, an or be part of the organized Jewish uh, community so that we would be visible as a community. I Why did think that, of that so important? Well, I think I uh, imbibed the value of Kiddush Hashem in a way that it is the way that uh, it's used in the Talmud, not in the sense of martyrdom, but in the sense of an example. If the, uh, we should be an exemplary people, and our actions in the public reign, uh, realm should uh, reflect Jewish values. And so you could say that was uh, defensive, or you could say that was you know, the foundation of, uh, of Judaism, as far as I was concerned. So uh, we... Uh, I was always proud of uh, being a Jew in these movements. Never, never, the tensions uh, which emerged only slowly in the late 60s and early 70s between progressive politics and Jewish identity uh, uh, hadn't, hadn't quite formed. Um, at that point, then it became important to be a, be a progressive voice in the Jewish community. Uh, the New York Havara as I said, was always oriented towards the organized Jewish community. Uh, although we were countercultural, we we had we we were trying to influence people. That's why it was uh, a, a Jewish organization to, to uh, oppose the war and to therefore try to bring the Jewish community to be involved. The same thing, you know, successor organizations like Brera, the Jewish community's views on Israel and Palestine. Uh, were important, not not just what individual individual Jews felt, but we we were trying to influence public opinion already then within the Jewish community right. and to you, the kind of Judaism that we thought was authentic. You yourself had been um, involved in the Jewish counterculture in a variety of different right. ways as right. it was beginning right. to take shape. Um, can you tell us about your work as editor of the Jewish Student Press yes, yes. Service? Yes, so, yeah. So there were two big institutions, well there were one, but the press service was part of a network, the North American Jewish Students Network. That was the Jew the, the movement, people spoke about the movement uh, in general in the late 60s, and there was a Jewish movement. Most of the people involved in that I discovered once I, I came in through the press service uh, were Habonim, Hashemer, Zionist, uh, progressive Zionist, um, many of them secularists, uh, f uh, some of them even uh, sort of the last wave of uh, Yiddishist uh, uh, workman circle and uh, there was a Yugen troop and um, so um, it was very, very, very different from uh, the Chavra movement. I happened to, uh, when I was in Israel for Two years, the second year. So the first year you were doing what? The first year I was a visiting graduate student in, in Israel. So I, I took the courses at Hebrew University. Uh, HUC hadn't started its year in Israel program yet. I see. I see. So. Uh, so, or maybe it started that year, but I was already, I was a visiting graduate student at Hebrew U. Um, and that, that's basically what I did, but I, I chose to stay another year, take a leave of absence from rabbinical school to continue to work in my Hebrew and also because I was really in love with being there, especially Jerusalem. Um, so I, uh, I got a job through the Jewish Student Press Service and that's how I heard about the student movement. I, it hadn't really impacted on the New York Havarad. It, it was around the same time. I'm not sure when the first National Jewish Students Network uh, conference was. I believe it was in 69. So I think right, right around the same time there was this uh, in effect, secular Jewish student movement, part of the World Union of Jewish Students. Uh, 69. Yeah. 
So, uh, so I heard about it when, when I was in Israel and applied for the job as the, the first editor. I set up the, uh, the, uh, the Israel Bureau, the Jewish Student Press Service. What was the Jewish Student Press Service? At the beginning, it was a press service to what was another uh, phenomena emerging then, which were Jewish student newspapers. There are 20 or 30 Jewish student newspapers. Uh, Genesis 2, I think, was in the first wave. If not, it was in the second year of it. So most campus, most large campuses of Jewish enrollment had a Jewish student newspaper. So the press service was formed by network to service with content uh, to be a JTA, Jewish Telegraphic Agency, for the Jewish student press. We also, press service collected them and sent out the papers by mail to all the other, all the papers. The, the first year there were 20 or 30, at one point I think there were 50 or 60 Jewish student papers in the late 60s, early 70s. And, so, and I, worked as the, I worked as the Israel editor from 71 to 72, and then the editor of the Jewish Student Press Service from 72 to 73. While I was in rabbinical school, I had a full-time job. It was an interesting experience in how, how much sleep you need or don't need. Because uh, I would <laughs> yeah. get to the press service at 6.30 in the morning for a few hours, go to class, and come back. Um, but I, so the, the press service, and being in contact, we did a, a tour for editors while I was in Israel of, from the papers. We were supported by the, quote, Jewish establishment, the press service, particularly in Israel. Our money came from the, the foreign ministry, uh, the Histadrut, and the, and the Sochnut. The Norva Hechelutz, Marla Baron, Mordechai Baron. So my boss was uh, Mordechai Baron, um, Shulamit, not Shulamit, um, uh, Colette, uh, Colette Avital oh, yeah. from the Foreign Ministry, and Yitzhak, uh, Yitzhak uh, the head of the Histadrut, was nominally, uh, why well, his last name is disappearing on me, but anyway, um, uh, so I met, or heard about, was in touch with what was going on campuses. At that point it was still pretty much undergraduates, progressive Zionists, basically. In, Amer in, the in North America, America? North America. North America. So when I came back uh, and became the editor of the press service, the press service office was in the office of the North American Jewish Student Network, shared an office in the clothing district in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, so I, I had a foot in that camp, and the Chavara camp were totally different places. Um, um, the only place where they intersected was, was Response Magazine, which was sort of one of the, one of the, uh, one of the organizations that received money from Network, which received money from established Jewish organizations who were trying to connect with, youth, with the youth. So we were considered, uh, you know, very important to invest in uh, young people, whatever they were doing. And we were doing sort of radical Jewish politics, the beginnings of what became uh, the um, ideas of Brera, that was something called the Radical Zionist Alliance, RZA, mm -hmm. uh, that was part of the same group uh, of uh, the North American Jewish Students Network. What about your year in Israel, though? You, you had alluded to earlier the yeah. fact that this was extremely mm. um, formative in terms of your Right, well, even more so. The, 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 just, two, just two months there on, a, on an Ulpan oriented me toward Israel as the, the really central. I, I became a Zionist. I was not raised a Zionist, but just spending time there and, and realizing what was emerging. This was 1970. I mean, it's... You know, three years uh, after the Six Day War, the, there's no way to, to live a full Jewish life without a deep connection and involvement in, in Israel. It's, it's just, it's, it's, in, it's intellectually impossible. And, and because I, I, I loved it so much there and felt so powerfully connected with its potential, um, I came back a Zionist and I've been involved. And the New York Havara was, uh, again, of the three. Uh, Chavarod, we were the ones who were most engaged in Israel. Uh, that's partly because Bray Ra formed from members of the New York Chavarod, but even before that, uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, John and Peter were deeply connected, John Ruskay and Peter Geffen were deeply connected to Israel, been there back and forth. John was studying uh, Middle East politics at, at Columbia, so we had speakers from Israel. We were, we were involved. Um, we, we, we were not the, the, the counterculture that, that, that sort of turned away from Israel to develop a, a, a non-Zionist brand, which was somewhat true of the Chavra movement as it developed. Um, it was extremely focused on creative Jewish communities here. We were back and forth to Israel. A lot of the members, um, and uh, uh, I remember when John Ruskay brought Nachum Goldman to speak uh, to the, to the uh, New York Chavra, and it, it was a uh, subject of debate and involvement, and. Uh, we were pretty much on one side. I mean, Can there were a couple of people. Who he was? Uh, Nachum Golden. Yeah. Nachum Golden uh, was probably the most prominent uh, international Jewish leader between 1920 and 1960 uh, in the world. He was the head of the World Zionist Congress and the, world, the head of the World Jewish Congress at different times. Uh, lived most of his life in Switzerland. Um, he, he had become famous in the 19, late 60s because he tried uh, to negotiate with uh, the Egyptian government uh, on behalf of Israel and, and was already talking about, uh, before the Six-Day War, ability, uh, in, uh, diplomatic connections that could be made between the two. Um, so he's about, he was the senior statesman of the Jewish world. And here he was, I don't know, 80 years old, coming in uh, a very impressive uh, suit of clothes that was, he was a very wealthy man. I don't know where his money came from, but we were all there in torn jeans and uh, looked pretty raggedy. And he sat there and told us his, his view of the Six Day War and, uh, and uh, how it could have been avoided. And, and this is but, before the Yom Kippur Wars, right? Yes. In that inter -period. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, how had your experiences in Israel, those two years in Israel, well, Helped shape your view. You, yeah. you were a Zionist, but right. I, what I read, my knowledge level was pretty low. The first ketha, the first paragraph at the Ulpan at Hebrew University, uh, I remember it in August of uh, of 1970, uh, was a paragraph written by Shlomo Avineri, who's still around and uh, right. became Director General of the Foreign Ministry, mm -hmm. a political scientist, and it was about two, uh, two peoples, one land, two peoples. So we're, I'm reading, I'm learning modern Hebrew more effectively, and that's the first thing that I'm reading in the Olpan. Uh, but that year that I spent as a journalist, I did travel extensively uh, on the West Bank. Um, it was much easier to travel on the West Bank um, those days, and there, they weren't safe. It's definitely safer. I mean, you could, we, it, it wasn't the perception wasn't that it was safer, but it was. I, I had as my guide uh, an Israeli. Uh, a war resistor, pacifist named Yosef Avilea, who played in the Israeli Philharmonic uh, and uh, had, had a certificate of Ihatama, and it doesn't belong in the, uh, in the army because he was a pacifist. That's how you, which was not helpful to him in Israeli society, but in a Philharmonic orchestra, it didn't matter. So he introduced me to Palestinians who I, I met and, and uh, talked about their aspirations and it was so close to the Six Day War, people really didn't know what to make of it. But they were Palestinians; they weren't Jordanians, um, and uh, so I, I had an upfront view uh, of what the dynamic was. And I met people like Marla Baron, who became a very important uh, peace activist uh, over the years. But was then head of the department in the Nova Hechelutz and a protege of Moshe Dayan and Lova Eliav. Um, so there were very important Israeli intellectuals, politicians, who were talking about two, two people, one land, two peoples, and what would the solution be? Some people thought, uh, as Abba Ibn, did, Abba Ibn said, uh, three states: uh, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Benelux. But it was it was talked about already then. Um, so I I, I developed. Was a pretty strong level of knowledge and spoke a little Arabic enough to get around. And how would you characterize your views at the time that you sort of well, by the time you came you know, back to the states? Well, uh, I wasn't an activist, but I understood that there was a, an issue here. 
the settlements were the the the, the problems that, that in articulating the issue were, were really because of Golda Meir, who was uh, claiming that there was no such thing as a Palestinian. And if you had lived in Israel and been on the West Bank, you knew that there were. And uh, so at that point, you had a labor government completely denying that there was any issue and you had a press for settlement. So we, we knew that it, it was kind of uh, blind. To, to be thinking in those terms. And of course, people knew that Ben-Gurion had said, how can we give this back right after the Six-Day War? We, we have to get rid of the, uh, 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 the, this will destroy Israel to have, a, uh, to be able to, to, to maintain control of the West Bank and, uh, and Gaza. And there were a few people in the Labor Party and, and left of the Labor Party. And I got to know a few of them, interviewed some of them. So um, I came back, uh, uh, convinced that there had to be an accommodation with the Palestinians and we started talking about it before we formed Brera in, in March of 1973 at an Interchavra conference. That was a, actually quite an interesting uh, conference. You might say it was similar to what I described that the two places that uh, people were on November 15th, 1969. In March of 1973 there was a gathering at Rutgers Hillel an interchavra gathering. Alan Mintz was the, uh, it was Alan's idea, but uh, it was so long ago that poor Alan hadn't gotten the message that you had to have a certain number of women at this thing. So he invited like 49 guys and Ar Arwin Agus or something like that. And, uh, and for Brengen refused to, to participate unless there were more women invited. Uh, and in, I, and unless I think they had an anti-egalitarian uh, uh, anti -anti bias too, we, we'll, we'll choose who comes from Verbrengen. So uh, Alan uh, thought he was inviting uh, the, the people who were most knowledgeable about the two subjects. Uh, the point was half of the group was dealing with new halakha, which was a concept, uh, more of a Verbrengen concept than anybody else's uh, concept. but. Uh, if we're a serious movement, which we were already talking about then, then, and we aren't orthodox, maybe there are egalitarian halachot that we should be evolving. So there's a group of people then, and Yitz Greenberg was there. I mean, it's sort of a, Yitz was uh, in, involved uh, uh, as a scholar and a friend of the Chavra movement. Yitz so Greenberg, an important a, modern orthodox rabbi. This so, is already talking it thinking in terms of, there were three Chavarot. Right. Chavarot at that point. Right. But thinking already in terms of a movement. Oh, de Chavarot. definitely. Definitely. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think in some ways more for Brengen, which was uh, as I said, more political in some ways. Uh, but uh, there's a section that was New Halakha, and then there's a section on uh, what was called the discussion between Zionist and non-Zionist except by definitions that anybody would have used, they were all Zionists, except that there were a couple of Israeli radicals who defined themselves as non-Zionists. But it was, uh, how, how do we think within our countercultural community about is Israel as a Jewish state and the Palestinians? What, how, do, how do we square our progressive values with what was the already beginning to seem like an occupation? Um, because it, w I mean, the word probably wasn't in our vocabulary. This was now. now we're talking March seventy three. March seventy three. So yeah. this is before, still before the war. The, the yeah. War. yeah, 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 yeah. So and we, you're talking about um, this is a, a Chavura conference, or it's, it was broader no, than that. A little bit broader, but almost. No, I think. I mean, Alan, I think was drawing from the three Chavurot and maybe a couple of other people. Uh, uh, but it basically was uh, uh, the three Chavarot because it, it, one of the things that happened out of it was the impetus to move toward Weiss's, what were called Weiss's farm gathering, the inter Chavara retreats, they were called. So that was the first one, but it, it wasn't called that. Uh, I don't know what it, I don't think uh, it, it said inter Chavara, but that, that is what, in fact, what it was. There were, uh, uh, a couple people, and well, I mean, 
Oh, poor Steve, Stephen Cohen just passed away this week. Stephen P. Cohen uh, was there. Um, and he may have been connected with Chavrat Shalom at that point. He was in Boston. Uh, but he and John were the sort of leading intellectuals in the Israel-Palestine side of the discussion. And that's, that's the side that I participated in. Um, and I had a lot of direct experience uh, um, from my time there, so I nat was naturally drawn to that. This group was divided into two parts, and both of them had an, a strong afterlife. A new halakha as a concept faded. There was a new halakha newsletter uh, that Richard Friedman from Fabringen edited, where we would, uh, there would be a discussion of what would a progressive halakha look like. Um, and what and, and issues of egalitarian worship would have been part of that, uh, for, uh, for example, what, what liturgy, what role of women, that, that it was clear that traditional halakha didn't fit, but our practice wasn't as good as our uh, preaching. So it also, I think, gave a, a strong impetus that you, we, this uh, Ezra and Nashim idea is, this has got to happen, and we're not even, we're not even including women in the intellectual uh, vanguard of the Chavra movement. So, uh, it, um, but there were, well, once the meeting happened, uh, uh, there were several more women that had been uh, uh, invited in the, in the first part, and, uh, and poor Alan had to do tshuva for years, uh, I think. Uh, um, but both discussions were very, were very uh, serious. So, but as a concept, new halakha as opposed to the minhagim that we developed over the years, I, I think lasted for a year or two as an intellectual construct and didn't have an afterlife, but it did. It was definitely part of the early discussions at Weiss's farm. So the conference was the precursor to the Interchavra retreats, and it was definitely the precursor to Bray Ra. Uh, out, of, out of this conference, we said, well, we're very concerned uh, that uh, things aren't moving, the Palestinians uh, uh, are being boxed in by settlements, the new movements, and by no recognition of the fact that, uh, uh, that the West Bank, uh, which we focused on more in Gaza, uh, weren't being assimilated into Israel, couldn't be assimilated in Israel, and shouldn't be assimilated into Israel. So we were quite aware of that, and from the, this conference, we decided to gather regularly, of course we thought we means people in New York, mostly New York Havara members. Uh, we met Michael Walzer came up from Princeton to talk to us. We created something called the call to discussion. Call to discussion on, on Middle East, on Israel diaspora relations, that's what it was called. Um, and uh, we were very concerned that this situation was, uh, uh, was dangerous and we were talking summer of uh, 1973, we had several meetings, and then the war happened. And we got together after the war and said, we've got to be an organization in the Jewish community. This was predictable. If we don't learn the correct lessons from that war, um, Israel is going to be threatened by not solving the Palestinian issue. So what the call to discussion then became Breira in October, November, of uh, 19, uh, November, December, 1973. <coughs> um, Did, 15, what, what? more than, there were 10 or 11 of us who were on a, uh, on a uh, working committee, I think we called it. Um, was um, Arnold Wolf part of this group? No, no, uh, he, Arnie was brought in much later, hmm. much later. Um, it was all, again, people, now we were a few years older, maybe we were all 25. Um, 26. So it was some of the same people, and, and um, it was certainly John and Peter were John Ruskay, John and Peter Ruskay, Geffen. Peter Geffen. Mm -hmm. uh, David Saperstein was part of the original group. He was a rabbinical student at HUC. Uh, at HUC, uh, there are a few other folks who were Havara people. Gershon Hundert, uh, now professor in, uh, at McGill. Um, Ross Brand, a professor at NYU. So they're graduate students and rabbinical students. Uh, and New York Havara people, um, and we began to collect advisors uh, uh, for credibility, basically. Uh, we, we knew as much as they did, but our liberal uh, friends and allies like Gene Borowitz, um, 
and um, uh, from the seminary, Morton Siegel, who was an educator at the, 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 uh, at the seminary. Um, Joachim Prince was the, on the first uh, advisory committee, the great rabbi uh, who emigrated from Berlin in the 30s and was the person who spoke before Martin Luther King at the march in 1963. Um, so we had really what we thought were important scholars and communal people behind us. And um, we developed uh, a whole network of people like that, mostly intellectuals and all, all pretty much focused around New York or at least uh, uh, in, in the, the East. One of the other ones was um, uh, David uh, Gordis uh, was with us from the beginning. There were six or seven people. Sidney Morgan best on the faculty at the, at Columbia. But we we uh, met, so we needed a name. Gerson said we should have a Hebrew name uh, to demonstrate our Zionist uh, um, credibility and our Zionist belief and our Zionist involvement. So uh, we all knew the the slogan in Israel at the time was Ein Brera. It would be nice to do something better for the Palestinians. We have no choice. Ain Brera. So we called ourselves Brera, um, which at one point got us into a misunderstanding, or uh, probably intentional, that we considered ourselves an, an, alternate, an alternative to Zionism, that we were a non-Zionist group, when we were precisely the Zionist uh, element of the, of the counterculture. We were the ones who cared the most and paid the most attention to Israel and its future. Um, so uh, we, we were profoundly uh, Zionist uh, uh, in, in our approach. We thought, as I had myself learned, you, you, you can't really have an authentic Jewish community in the diaspora and ignore what's going on in the state of Israel. Hopefully you can be enriched by it. It can be enriched a little bit by the diversity and, and experimentation. We have a little more freedom because of the way Israel developed. Uh, but we had much to learn uh, and much to gain from a, a connection. Breira, when it started, was a, also called a project of concern in Israel diaspora relations. And a lot of what our ideological uh, and practical uh, steps were how can we get the American Jewish community to talk about these issues. So we also had democracy and Jewish life, uh, the role of intellectuals, but an, an openness to ideas and a, and a, and a deeper connection with Israel um, and the, the varieties of opinion in Israel. Um, because at this point you had Golda Meir as the prime minister and Golda was a universally loved or respected person in American Jewish life and the labor, the labor Zionists who were still in power had a lot of difficulty with uh, Breira. They had a lot of difficulty, some of whom became later very strong doves like Arthur Hertzberg and Label Fine and Art and um, Al Vorspan opposed Breira because uh, we were criticizing the labor government. And this is long before Begin. Yeah. Uh, and it now, took them what, a while to, to come around. At what point did uh, members of other Chavarot, particularly for Brengen, get involved, Arthur Waskow mm -hmm. and others? Well, uh, somewhat later, when we expanded to become a national organization and expanded the board, um, and uh, Arthur already was uh, had a reputation as a sort of an, an antagonist in the Jewish community, which was un very unfortunate because Arthur was a deeply creative influence on many people in the Jewish community. And the Jewish community was a little slow in understanding that somebody who, who real and Arthur is, is the, the first person to create a modern Haggadah, which now every movement uh, uh, does. Uh, and the, the Freedom Center was the first of its kind. Uh, and he's been an inspiring intellectual and spiritual figure for a long time. But then he was the enemy of the Jewish people as far as the Jewish establishment. Uh, was a vigorous uh, political progressive and not at all ashamed to say, uh, as a Jew, I oppose the war in Vietnam and I'm going to be in, and my friends here are going to plant trees in Vietnam. I mean, uh, the conservative, the, the true conservative Jewish community thought he was uh, public enemy number one. 
So when Arthur wanted to be involved and people and be on the board, we sort of said, gee, if we have Arthur on the board, we're going to attract all this heat on, onto us. Do we need that? And we decided we were not going to exclude Arthur, who was our, already our teacher, and, uh, and well, we'll just have to face the music uh, when it happened. And that's exactly what happened. But we knew it was going to happen, and it happened. The, the, the attacks on, on Bray Ra came from the far right of the, of the Jewish community, a JDL spin-off group called the Americans for Safe Israel. And they, they Rael Jean Isaacs wrote this pamphlet, it's about 25 pages, 20 pages of it was about Arthur. Nothing, uh, nothing was on Bray Ra and its platform and the people were involved. Was all, Arthur had a post office box next to this organization. It was pure red baiting. Arthur and a couple of other people, uh, poor Barry Rubin, um, who ended up being quite conservative Jewish academic on, on Middle East questions. But when he was 16, he was a socialist worker guy and he wrote a, a negative piece about Israel when he was 16. So Barry Rubin, who wrote, wrote for the Bray Rock publication, wasn't central at all. And Arthur, who was a member of the, on the 25-member board and wasn't particularly central, although we loved him and were happy to have him, uh, but uh, uh, he was never particularly central in the organization. The organization only lasted effectively for three years, I mean, four and on formally. Well, yeah. yes, the conference was in 77, so uh, by the time we incorporated in 74, that's four or five years. Uh, yeah. Can you articulate what the the, the main um, uh, positions of Bray Ra were and what was so mm -hmm. controversial? Well, what was wouldn't controversial, we, we, we raised the question, wouldn't Israel be safer if there was a, a Palestinian self-determination? Uh, we didn't use a, two states as a later form. We talked about Palestinian self-determination as being in the interest of Israel. Uh, and we thought that the Jewish community in North America should have an open discussion about those, those kinds of issues. Uh, and that open discussion would clearly bring out views that were uh, opposed to the Israeli government. So we brought in uh, Lova Eliyav, uh, Mayor Pa'il, uh, important voices from the Israeli, the Davish Israeli community. Um, and that was, if, if it was, um, it was still early in the structure of the American Jewish community. The Council of Presidents was was fairly new. Council of Presidents was formed by Nachum Goldman, actually. Uh, but um, APAC had just started in the 70s. Um, and its job was to represent the Israeli government. So if here's an American Jewish organization saying maybe they got some things wrong and we should listen to dissident is Israelis and think for ourselves as American Jews, deeply threatening. Um, uh, just the idea of, of dissent uh, was threatening. Um, and that, so it, it was the idea as much as what we said. What we said was opposed by the Labor Party, I mean, they, uh, for sure, but it, it wasn't so radical. It's more that the principle of dissent was not recognized. Right. Um, what happened? What happened, this critique that came from the far right, which would have been easy to defend against, uh, was picked up by APAC um, in its early stages, and they, they sent it around. I mean, they sent around a document that was produced by a JDL spinoff, and that gave it credibility. And our goal was, of course, we did in some way want to influence uh, uh, American policy, but the, the, the stakes weren't what they, what they are now. We were trying to influence the discussion in the Jewish community. We were an educational, like the New York Chabara, we wanted to impact on the community. We wanted people to look at, really look at Israel more closely and ultimately to agree with us and then to help convince Israel that uh, it was on a suicidal path. So, um, uh, once the official organized Jewish community was distributing stuff about us, then we had to defend ourselves, and, and we, were already, we were mortally wounded um, by that first attack. 
we, we, we existed for another couple of years. We had to defend ourselves. And, and the, the, the attack was so tendentious. It wasn't on our policies. It was on our people. So we had to defend people. And then we had our own um, organizational issues, some of them having to do, in my opinion, to do with sexism. And I mean, that's sort of some problems right around the same time uh, in, the, in the small staff that we had. And uh, we had one major funder and that hurt when that funder got discouraged about uh, not the attacks on us, but our the fact that we were kids and weren't weren't as strong as we could have been uh, organizationally. So we lost our major funder, but we were mortally wounded by the folks who were trying to keep uh, discussion and dissent down. That, that's what happened. We weren't strong enough to survive. When I I uh, I was part of a faction, a small pa faction on the Bray Rob board that felt we should be multi-issue. Um, we had a discussion about that and I, I think it was voted like 18 to 3 that our strength was our, our Zionism and our Israel-Palestine issues and being multi-issue would be distracting. I thought we should work on issues of economic justice and, and uh, um, feminism and the Jewish community here. We, we worked, by the way, not just on Israel-Palestine. We, we did do work, a little bit of work, on what were called the uh, Ashkenazi-Sardi uh, split, social gap questions in Israel, but not, not so much. In Israel? In Israel, in Israel. But I felt we should be working as a multi-issue progressive Jewish organization, and because uh, I also felt we'd, we'd be more authentic. I mean, we, we came across as critics of Israel without any roots in the Jewish community here. We had very credible people, intellectual leaders of the community attached to us. Jesse Lurie of uh, Hadassah Magazine, was a, the editor, was a big supporter of ours. Mm -hmm. One point even J uh, Jacob Neusner was on, on the advisory committee. So we, we had a lot of intellectuals, but we didn't have grassroots. And our chapters, we had chapters, but very few. We, were, we, we didn't have good grassroots, and I thought we'd be more authentic as an pr expression of progressive Jewish identity, which was um, uh, in inclusive of a progressive view on Israel. You didn't think that would sort of fatally dilute the Well, the other people thought power. that organizationally. That, so, that's what they the thought. Zionist issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I thought it would just give us credibility as an American Jewish uh, organization, which was also uh, deeply concerned about Israel, that uh, not defensive uh, sort of. Uh, I mean, American Jewish Committee had, wasn't in the same position it is then, but to the extent they they dealt with Israel, they were defending the government. The same thing with the ADL, which also hadn't yet really moved into uh, defending Israel as a major issue. So uh, I, I I thought uh, that would. But good strategy, and that was what we believed in. So I thought we should do it through the organization. That's what I did when when Brera folded, and John Rusquet turned to me uh, at at the meeting where we had to figure out what to do with the the money that we still owed. How had it folded? I mean, what what brought it, it to that point? Financially ultimately? folded, and we had no, we we weren't able to sustain anything. Once once a, a big funder had, had backed out. Um, and our credibility to organize in the Jewish community had been so damaged, uh, we just ran out of steam. Uh, so that's 77? Um, 78, mm -hmm. uh, probably the fall of 78. Yeah, fall of 78. The last meeting was in the fall of 78. And uh, so, so we, we sit, sit around the room, the board, who do we pay off credit, how do we dissolve the organization? So we have all that discussion, and uh, and I turned to John, and I said, "What? I, we finished this. What are we going to do now? What's next?" He said, "It's your turn." So that's that's when New Jewish Agenda. That was the Beginning. the transition was very direct. John said, y y "It's your turn." So uh, from that, the uh, New Jewish Agenda. Uh, was born conceptually, and I felt uh, organizationally wouldn't make the same mistake, and it would, the New Jewish agenda would include a progressive Zionist vision, but it wouldn't be the 
it wouldn't be the whole uh, organization. It was a multi-platform yes. organization. Yes, yes, we had a platform on the Central America, we had a platform on Argentine, Argent anti-Semitism, yeah. on gay rights, which is very strong. We were f sort of first national organization to take that on as a major issue for... In the late 70s. Late 70s, 80s. yeah. yeah. Yeah, our founding conference was uh, December 1980, but the organization, the first meeting was in the New York Havra apartment. Uh, it was not my apartment any longer, I was already at Rutgers. Uh, but in May of 1979, um, I invited about 200 people, I think about 75 people were there. I invited half men and half women, didn't make that mistake again. And uh, about 75 were there number of them from the various cover wrote, uh, including for Brangen. Um, and uh, we formed the, the organizing committee for a new Jewish agenda at that point. Took, and we organized slowly and carefully and built grassroots around the country. So by the time we had a founding conference in December 1980, there were probably 20, 25 chapters. So we were much harder to destroy, even if our views were uh, even further out, um, in some ways, uh, than Ray Ra. But they were, they were clearly progressive across the board. So, I mean, a, a, a Jewish conservative would definitely not have liked us, even if they agreed uh, with some of our platform. We were a progressive voice in the Jewish community and a Jewish voice in the progressive community. That was our formula. Um, and, and we were. Yeah. But it was. All these things were sort of outgrowths of the New York Havara and its ethos and its attempt to organize the Jewish community or influence the Jewish community in certain ways. We, we um, I mean, we spoke about it originally in terms of leaders. I think we were talking about the community itself. It's, it's uh, democratization, it's uh, ultimately uh, empowerment of women, although not so much at the beginning, and it's acceptance of uh, of uh, uh, gay, lesbian, right. the whole uh, gamut. I think the, our, no, our whole instinct was to, was to try to influence the, uh, the nature of the Jewish community. Writ large. Writ and, large, yeah. And no, I you think that was different, but from, you were, different but, from... But you were providing leadership also at the same time. That was we, we were pushing, creating, these, pushing right. these, these uh, ideas and creating the, the organizational structures that would give them uh, right. functionality. Right. And, and so so as, as mm -hmm. Ezra Nashim, so Ezra, that was an interesting place I happened to be in the, the, the place uh, where this is happening. You have the religious feminist movement, which came out of the New York Havara, essentially, or out of uh, 10 women on the Upper West Side, uh, were the strongest leaders of it. Of course, there were people all over the country eventually. Um, so Ezra Nashim comes out of the New York Havara, Brayra comes out of the New York Havara. What became the Jewish Women's Resource Center was physically in the Havara. Laura Geller, my friend, uh, I got her a grant to, to work on Jewish Women's Resource Center while she was a, still a rabbinical student. What was the, the uh, mission of the Jewish Women's Resource Center? Uh, create, create liturgy, create historical materials, uh, um, it was some kind of gathering of information and resources for uh, the Jewish community, but reflecting a feminist perspective. And at one point, the Brera office and the Jewish Women's Resource Center were in the New York Havara apartment. I think what I think the 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 impetus ended up in Boston with uh, whatever it's called now. But I, I, that was. Uh, What's the Jewish Women's... Uh, Jewish Women's Archive? Archive, yeah. Is yeah, that in Brewer. Boston? Yeah. Yeah. So this was the them. first stage of that. Um, um, so, oh, what I was saying was the, the, move, the movements came together, the Chavra movement and the, the Jewish student movement came together with the Women's Conference, the first national Jewish Women's Conference. Uh, also in the early 70s. Yes. Well, 70, yes, 73, 73. probably. Um, and that's when the religious community and the secular Zionist feminist community of the Jewish student movement came together. Uh, so that was a powerful gathering. Uh, Yitz Greenberg, the first one, I think Yitz was the only man who was allowed to uh, enter. Blue Greenberg was very involved. 
I was there as a support. I brought the Sifrei Torah, but I didn't go into the, the hotel, uh, or I gave it to somebody in the hotel. Um, and that, that was um, Ezra Nashim meets the Jewish student movement. Um, and about 800 people, I believe, came to that first I conference. I think so. I mean, it could, could be. I, it was a very large conference. The sec, either the second or the third conference was the Jewish women's men's conference. Exactly. Um, so, um, but those are the sort of things that emerged from, a, uh, from the Chavara because of its focus on the Jewish community. Uh, in, in ways that uh, um, most Chavarot emphasize the fellowship or, or specialized in, in things like Chavarot Shalom, my way of thinking specialized in intensive liturgy and davening and liturgical creativity um, and influenced us all in a, by their products. I mean, right. the, the people and, and some, of, some of the things that they wrote and put together. The New York Chavarot never wrote a Sidur. Uh, um, that wasn't our that wasn't our strength or our, our strength was creating organizations so did you see your work uh, in, in the creation and, and, and moving forward with Brain Ra as essentially part and parcel of your Kamara, uh sort of I mean yes and no yes and no I mean it, it, clearly we were bringing in people who this was uh, a politically important to them, or ideologically, or their way of expressing their love for Israel. Uh, but the style in which it formed with a working committee of 10 of us, with an egalitarian leadership, it took us a while uh, uh, before we formed the typical organization. We were a working committee for quite a while. Um, and, uh, and it brought, expanded the first uh, national uh, uh, leadership, the first national board, past the Arthur stage, uh, mm -hmm. as a board of our friends and contacts who wanted to be involved, we mandated it to be uh, at least a third women. So there were sort of things that were coming out of the Habara movement, although some mm -hmm. from the beginning un unwillingly. Uh, and um, uh, it was pretty egalitarian leadership. And Arnie was the first national chair, Rabbi Arnold Wolf. Um, Arnold was really my Rebbe. Uh, uh, he taught at the rabbinical school, and I just admired him as somebody who had put all those those things together. A traditional pattern of observance for for uh, um, a reform rabbi, a personalist theology, uh, completely progressive politics across the board, civil liberties, civil rights, and Israel activism. Um, but the, the vote to make him chair uh, was 17 to 2. The two people who voted against him were himself and me. Uh, he said, I can't do this. I'm not a, I'm not a chair. That's not me. Look, look, you see, uh, you see the way I behave in meetings. And, uh, uh, but we, we thought Arnold was the best we had uh, and, and to be a, a representative. I mean, certainly intellectually and a powerful and uh -huh. wonderful, uh, challenging person to the Jewish community, yeah. so we, we picked Arnie and he and I voted against it. Relatively early on, when Bill Novak, who had come originally from uh, Havarat Shalom yeah. and then became a member of yes. the New York Havara, um talked about the what he called the inability um, to unite for joint political action on the part of the Havara as the outstanding failure of the New York Havara. Um, joint political action? Joint political action. Um, and mm -hmm. What I'm trying to understand is the relationship between all this incredible energy and creativity, which mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. essentially was the, the product in many ways of the New York Havara and its mm -hmm. members, mm -hmm. very political, very mm -hmm. strategic, organizationally mm -hmm. focused, mm -hmm. and this comment. Um, and, and others have talked about how uh, political activity uh, as, commu as, a, as a focus of communal uh, activity, as a priority for the New York Havara, qua Havara, faded over time. That's possible. Yes. Uh, well, uh, 
I mean, in, in a sense that we went off in single issue, what you would have thought of a single issue, Israel-Palestine as an issue. Uh, I mean, it emerged out of the Chavara, but it didn't, we didn't come in, so to say, you, the Chavara, this is the Breira of Chavara. Exactly. It would have, it, there wasn't a political process in, in the Chavara. If that's perhaps what Bill was, was saying, we didn't sort of vote on whether we should uh, form a Middle East-oriented peace or, or progressive Zionist organization. So it, um, and, you know, I, in talking about that first split, you would you could see there are people who wanted to work with inside the Jewish community as their primary uh, uh, emphasis, and there are other people who wanted to work from within the Jewish community on um, broader issues. So that split was there, and, and there was no point in resolving that split. So people specialized in what they what they most cared about. Uh, the Ezrat Nashim contingent did that, and. Um, other than forming a men's group out of jealousy, uh, uh, there's this consciousness raising group and deep, deep experience that our that our uh, our chaverot were having, and and we're just admiring them or being jealous of them. So we formed a Jewish men's group. Just had a reunion of that uh, um, a year ago in summer for some of us. So it was a very good and powerful and serious Jewish men's group, uh, mostly consciousness raising. What did it mean to be a Jewish uh, male? What what expectations are on Jewish men versus other men? Uh, how how uh, um, there was there was one of us who identified at that point as bisexual, which was we didn't know that, and, we, and was a, it was a, a safe enough space to talk about that. And um, uh, so, but we had one rule, uh, which is we couldn't tell our wives or partners what we talked about not even the subject uh, that was that was the one rule because it just it, we, we wanted that much uh, security and confidentiality, confidentiality uh, um, uh, so um, but it it was a powerful experience and we're still tied by that experience and we learned that from Ezra and Hashim we didn't discover we were we were Jewish men until there was a Jewish women's group. Then we realized we have a unique experience. Um, but we didn't, uh, you know, there, at some point there was attempts to form a Jewish men's movement. And uh, an interesting book by a man named Harry Broad from Kingman College on Jewish male experience. And it's definitely a, a subject, but we didn't organize. And almost everything we cared about, we then began to organize. We cared about Jewish education. We created a Chavara school and then tried to describe how the Chavara school is different from every other school that you would go to. So, okay. So I think I want to move now to the sort of concluding uh, mm -hmm. section uh, where we want to focus on the impact of the Chavara on you personally and uh, also more broadly on, mm -hmm. on the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. So. You've continued to be a member of the New York Chavara, mm -hmm. which right. has changed over time right. since since its inception until right. today. Is that correct? Right, that's right. And you also became a member of Fabrengen. Uh, Fabrengen. As soon as I got here, I always admired Fabrengen uh, uh, from a distance. Uh, there are certain unique characteristics of it. It's it is completely egalitarian in terms of ideology and. Uh, Max and es Ex Esther Tickton uh, made that a core of, and egalitarian in terms of access to leadership and and sharing of knowledge. I mean, there's an enormous valuing of whatever people's experience. Sometimes that can be a little bit boring or over uh, oversharing uh, in the early stages. Not so much as we've gotten older, uh, but um, it it it's it's a a very full community, almost a, uh, a, a shul in a way that the New York Chavara never was. Um, uh, but I guess Chavara Shalom I don't know as well. So, but the, the sort of egalitarian ethos, uh, and there are several rabbis who were members, uh, but nobody was the, uh, ever the rabbi of uh, Fabrengen by design. Right. 
So how else would you compare the, your experiences in the two communities as you continue to be mm -hmm. um, part of both? Yeah, well, uh, the new Kavara was, was really an elitist group, very well, and especially in the beginning, very well educated, very integrated into the Jewish community, and, if, and in some ways maybe insular in that way. Uh, and for Brengen is whoever walks in the door, and there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be said from learning from everybody's uh, experience who, who, who comes and wants to share their experience. So, so for bringing it at its best is completely unpredictable and, uh, and, and joyful in, in, uh, in its creativity, even though it also is not such, was, was never um, uh, a liturgical uh, innovative community. Its strength was its egalitarianness, the, the, the openness of the Torah discussion, which is still the center as much as the, the davening is, uh, um, was, was very, very productive. It was productive for Jewish feminist thinking and, and uh, influenced Arthur, of course, greatly and many other people. Uh, uh, um, so so I, I, I love it. I, I, the form of a chavra, I mean, rather pray with people I know and can get to know than with people I don't know. Some people prefer sort of just davening and, and use in a meditative kind of way and it's better if they're almost almost better if they, uh, they don't know so much about the people around them. They're just in a space, they're in an ocean and that's, it's spiritually strong for them. Uh, it's not particularly my taste, although I understand it completely. What do you think the most significant ways that these Chavarot have evolved or changed over time would be? Well, the Chavarot Jewish renewal, I would say slash Jewish renewal, because some of the people moved through that passage and some of them were already connected to Reb Zalman from the beginning, like Richie Siegel. Um, so there was a, a background of Jewish renewal within the Chavarot, more, more in Chavarot Shalom, of course. Um, and that's had a tremendous impact on, on, on the Jewish community in, in many ways. Uh, I think stronger than, the, I'm not one of those, I never thought there was a Chavra movement. Um, there were Chavrot and we had a lot in common and it was wonderful to get together. So inter Chavra sharing, I uh, was very big on, but the, there weren't any axioms or postulates about the Chavra that made it into a movement. Uh, other than small is beautiful and informality is a, is a positive value. It was a style, almost a style rather than an ideology. And I totally love the style and feel most comfortable in, uh, uh, in Chavra style. But renewal is, it has more characteristics of a movement and has influenced particularly liturgy uh, in, in a different kind of, in a much more powerful way than the Chavra as a Chavra did, that where we've been influential, it's where I think we overlapped with the Jewish Renewal Movement. Um, I was on the board of Aleph when I mean, that question was argued, are we a movement? Reb Zalman didn't want to be a movement. He, Jewish we, Renewal, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I was I'm never on the board of the National Chavra Committee. Were you, were you involved? I, 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 I went to, a, uh, I was involved, the first conferences at Rutgers, I was the mashkiach. Yeah. I had to learn how to be a mashkiach, uh, to be the mashkiach, because we had the kosher kitchens mm -hmm. in Rutgers. Uh, but... Um, and did you go to some of the... I went, yes, I went to, yeah, well, I loved them. I mean, it was a lot, lot of fun, great learning, great so, uh, communal experience, a lot of friends. Um, I once taught a class where Zalman and um, Balfour Brickner and uh, one other very intimidating person was sitting there as my student, and uh, that was that was quite an experience. I had Reb Zalman there, th thinking I could teach him something. Um, uh, so I, I I participated in them because they were adult learning uh, the layerhouse. They were they were wonderful, great experiences. It's particularly for kids at the beginning. They did a tremendous job of childcare uh, at those uh, conferences. So I, I, I admired them, but I did, they weren't compelling to me that I should come every year and 
be part of this as opposed to any other Jewish priority that I that I had, um, and and to, I mean it's biographical, but I'm sort of a movement person and still never gave up trying to influence the community. Arthur asked me to be on the board of the Shalom Center, and then when the Shalom Center merged with Aleph um, or merged with Pnei Or to become Aleph, um, then I, I was for a while on that uh, on that board. And they, their issues at the beginning were, are, are we a movement? Should we be a movement? Uh, and Reb Zalman thought not. I uh, thought the movement is sort of the death of what we're doing. We're supposed to be, a, we should be a ginger group. We should be influencing all the movements rather than our own separate movement. But people, I mean, institutions uh, need form to uh, survive. And the form became a movement. Right. Um, so over the course of your career, you've, you've been a Hillel rabbi, you've been a congregational rabbi. Recent years, you've been the executive director of pluralistic and interfaith mm -hmm. organizations, clergy beyond uh, borders, and, and now the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington. How at all would you say your Havara, your experience of the Havara and the lessons you've taken from that have... Um, had an impact on your vision for your own rabbinate and for this this mm -hmm. re work you've been doing more recently, mm -hmm. interfaith and, and cross-culturally? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the uh, the notion that you could create your own community uh, uh, and you didn't have to be bound by what was there before was uh, with a bunch of people who were your peers uh, was a great lesson for me. I, I was influenced uh, uh, strongly by my peers there. I, I'm just amazed, uh, was amazed, and I'm still amazed by the uh, the energy of and creativity of John Ruskay and Peter Geffen and Alan Mintz. Uh, so I had real role models who were my age, uh, who said the Jewish community is missing this, um, and uh, and we can work to make it different, and and we have the capacity uh, to do that. So there. I mean, I, there, I had peer mentors uh, in the Chavra movement who are still important to me. Um, uh, that, um, again, because of my lack of background, uh, the, the, the Chavra gave me the, the, the idea that you really can have uh, uh, an engaged community that's across the board, that, that you can have those pillars, and, and it, it was holistic. The, the the holistic vision of the Chavara, uh I, I still believe in, I'm, and it confirmed for me that the, that you can have a movement and you can make a difference in people's lives that way. Um, but that was it, it was hard to keep it together, and perhaps Bill Novak and his comments was talking about that. But we didn't we didn't brand uh, ourselves in a political way as a Chavara or as a movement. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but there were many other side benefits. <laughs> yes. Um, so looking back at this holistic vision for the Chavara community, social, social activism and justice, prayer and, and learning, what do you see as the Chavara's greatest strengths? The New York Chavara or the Chavara movement? Both. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the Chavara, I mean, Cindy, my wife, of course, is late to this. Uh, mm -hmm. I've only been married for 31 years, so uh, she met everybody when we were already uh, had other other folks had kids. We didn't. Uh, um, it, this was a remarkable group of people. Is a remarkable group of people. Fortunately, we've only lost a couple. Um, so, um, despite my uh, concern about elitism, there was something to be said for people who were very bright, very focused, uh, uh, and, and demanding in some ways of each other uh, uh, in, in our study. And, and so um, it was an enormous influence, a uh, great learning experience, and uh, I think it was on, on everybody who was involved. Uh, and there were deep friendships along the way, so uh, which in of course, uh, made the learning even more powerful and, and the experience much greater joy. Yeah. Now, 
as I said, I, I don't think the, Hav the New York Havara uh, was a, a place that birthed a lot of new pathways for the American Jewish community, a surprising amount for a small group of people. Um, so it, it had an impact. Um, and all the, the, the three Chavarot had, because a lot of people, both of them became Jewish scholars and writers in their own, in their own right, so there was uh, uh, an influence on ideas of American Jews and the spiritual practice of American Jews, particularly non-Orthodox Jews. There are certain things uh, where we infiltrated, at least the habit of thought. Uh, um, there's a long article about the use of the word tikkun olam. Um, Tikkun olam is a, as a concept, is a Havra concept, the way it's used nowadays. Of course, it's an ancient text. It's, it's in the Gemara, used in a totally different way most of the time, except for the one instance where uh, Hillel ordains uh, the prose bowl and so that poor people can uh, borrow money in the year before the sabbatical year. So there is an, a use of the term Tikkun olam in the Talmud that fits what we're talking about. Um, but we popularized it. Um, we, uh, by the, there's a word study, uh, a man named Jonathan Krasner, it was published of the concept of Tikkun Olam. You see it in English, as an English word. When did it emerge? So it emerged in the late 70s, early 1980s. Um, and now it's a habit of thought for Jews and non-Jews. Oh, we admire you because you have the concept of tikkun olam. I've heard from dozens of clergy people. You repair the world. What a beautiful idea, the traditional Jewish value of tikkun olam. The, the word, as it's used now, for human beings to be active in the repair of the world is a chavra development, popularization, uh, semi-conscious on my part because uh, I went to Borowitz and said, I want to study this concept, uh, which I've heard about at the Chavara. I want to see how it's used. And he says, the way you're talking about it, I don't think it's ever used. And we, we had the, uh, uh, the advantage then that Bar Ilan had put, uh, put the uh, response of literature on computers, so you could check whether it was ever used like that, Tikkun Olam. Never, never used in the way we use it in modern time. He said, what you're talking about is Mi Pnei Darchei Shalom. For the sake of the paths of peace, we do certain things. Uh, so I, I, I was one of the major popularizers of the phrase tikkun olam, and every time I hear an Orthodox rabbi talk about it, or hear a president uh, like uh, Barack Obama talk about it, I, I smile because I, I know that this was a discussion we had in the, the New York Havara in the early 70s, uh, um, where, we, where we, we used the phrase and then began to apply it to organizations. Do you recall how it even came to the surface as a, well, a phrase to be Well, there's a long a scholarly article on that. Mm -hmm. there, it was used in Atid, the conservative youth, mm -hmm. youth uh, movement at the time, and therefore mm -hmm. some, some people raised in it might have used it accidentally like that. Shlomo Bardeen, the educator, used it in the way we use it now at the Brandeis camp. Uh, but uh, uh, we just talked about it all the time from the mid 70s on um, and it was on the stationary uh, New Jewish Agenda was the first organization that used it on the stationary and each time we changed the stationary we changed the definition so you had to explain what it was where the Jews devoted to the pursuit of tikkun olam parentheses the better ordering of human society in the natural world or what, whatever we thought the human uh, ordering human relationships because uh, I was writing those things, and I was aware of precisely how it was used in the, in the Talmud, which is frequently with respect to divorce law, um, how, how women could be abused by Jewish law by being divorced against their will without them even knowing about it. So, mipenei tikkun olam, we have to alter Jewish law for greater uh, social harmony and to not disadvantage women. But it, it was a, such a technical use. But we were trying very hard to, to connect it with its Talmudic uh, usage and a little bit with the way it was used by uh, Kabbalists in the 16th century. So now we're 2017, 2018 will be the 50th anniversary of the first 
Chavura. Yeah. And as the challenges of the 21st century come into clearer view for the American Jewish community, do you see a role for Chavurot and the major lessons of Chavurot uh, as we move forward as being useful? Um, well, I, 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 I mean, I'm still uh, believe in the holistic model, and I do believe that there's something to small is beautiful in the intimacy, uh, but that doesn't have to be a freestanding chavara. I mean, I think that the, the shuls that have utilized some of that in, in the way they organize the people are, are meeting and having a Jewish experience, deep Jewish experience in their homes with a small group of people in an ongoing way, I, I think is still, is still valid. I think it's still necessary and I think it's a, a good model for children. Um, I mean, they're Hebrew schools are much better than when uh, so are rabbinical schools and we, we, everything we do, we do better. But uh, I, I think the the style and the insights uh, uh, of the, the the small is beautiful, the intimate, holistic community are still valuable. Do you see a relationship between the independent minyanim of recent years and yes, the very much, uh, very much so. I mean, they uh, they. Some of them, there's one, a wonderful one here in Washington uh, called Tikkun Leil, which means Tikkun Leil Shabbat. So they've combined, uh, t they have a, they don't meet every week, they're not a Chavra, they're a davening group, but they have a speaker from either within the community or the general community on a, what they think of as a Tikkun alum subject. So it's part of their davening. They're just a Friday night community. So they, they picked up an element uh, of it, and the, 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 the Minyanim um, uh, picked up the, the creative uh, services and the, the intensity of being able to, to pray in a small group, like a shtibol. Uh, yeah. so we, we, we didn't invent the small as uh, beautiful either. I mean, and, uh, now, uh, the, very little was, was uh, innovative, but what we did, what is what Jewish communities at their best do, which pick pick up, uh, for centuries we've done this, pick up the best elements of the, the counterculture, in, in our case, the counterculture of the 60s, the, the small is beautiful, the egalitarian ethos, uh, and uh, so they're, they're picking up uh, what's best about the, the cultural things that can enhance Jewish life. So they're doing the same thing, but the, the, the era is different. For most of your career and your and your life, you were focused on uh, the the internal Jewish community, um, and now, in recent years, in, in your most recent uh, professional work, you've you've chosen to move into a realm that's uh, interfaith and sort of, as one of your organizations is called, crossing borders, crossing boundaries, yeah. and I'm wondering what. Uh, what took you in that direction? What drew you in that direction? And and how your 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 life experiences, especially as mm -hmm. they relate to the Chavura, sort of mm -hmm. brought you there and inform what you do today. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I've, uh, I thought you might ask about, uh, about something like that because we we weren't particularly engaged in interfaith uh, work. It's hard to. I mean, we deeply, uh, it wasn't just me, the, uh, a lot of people in the New York Havra had met uh, Dr. King and had worked in the South with him, uh, or if not him, with Andy Young, with other people in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I came from the South, they came from the North, but uh, uh, so we, we felt uh, a real involvement with issues of civil, civil rights, particularly because of the age we grew up in. But we didn't do in interfaith particularly. Uh, I can't think of any joint work that we did with uh, uh, congregations or with Union Theological Seminary, which is right across the street from JTS. Um, so, uh, and I can't think of uh, any, the rest of my friends who are doing what, what I'm doing now. Um, Possible that it, it relates more to my biography and having grown up in the, in the South and in the, in the, which was even in the 
my immediate community was heavily Jewish, but we were very distinctly a minority. And um, so, uh, I like in some ways, I think it's accidental. On the other, on the other hand, when I studied pastoral counseling after rabbinical school, and I had to write an essay for the class, it was essentially write your own obituary. I actually wrote uh, what. Happened, ended up happening. The last 10 years I worked with a, an interfaith setting and the stuff that I did uh, within the Jewish community, I did in, in the interfaith community. So uh, it, in that sense, it's part of uh, uh, my, my plan or God's plan. I also strongly identified as a prophetic Jew in the reform community that we should be uh, uh, Orla Goyim or lo or goyim, as it actually says. Uh, uh, and I discovered that in, in my work, uh, that uh, there's tremendous interest, particularly in, from Christians and Muslims, uh, in an actual Jewish person being involved in interfaith. There's tremendous philo-Semitism, and there's, uh, we do have something to teach uh, in the way that we address texts, the way that we do midrash, which is, Fascinating. Uh, I heard a, an African American uh, preacher on the Martin Luther King interfaith service tell the give, use as his text the the midrash of the angels uh, disputing with God about whether the world should have been created or not, and he says uh, there's this midrash, he says and uh, talks talks about it and uses his text should the world have been created, uh, so uh, it's uh, I. I I think that's one of the things we're supposed to do as Jews. So I, I, I feel like I'm doing what God wants me to do in this work. And I just was lucky that there was a job in which I could do it. Um, and I, I don't know how much of it I would have done if, if this job weren't available, but we work side by side with, uh, with our uh, fellow religionists of different flavors and everything else that we do, so why shouldn't we work uh, on these kinds of questions too? Well, thank you. I want to thank you very much, Jerry. It's been wonderful to talk to you, and uh, we really appreciate all of your insights and your introducing us today, really, to the New York Havarah and its yeah. history. So. Well, you'll, you'll hear the backstory, I think, as you talk to Peter and Alan. I mean, they can really tell you what happened in that uh, first year. Burton Weiss became a uh, uh, an active member of the Chabarat, and was then eventually came out, uh, first, I mean, he declared himself bisexual within the community. In fact, uh, we did a, ta and Peter, Peter Geffen, who was fooling around with a camera, uh, did uh, uh, a film with Burton and talking about the gay, Jew, uh, gay, gay homosexuality in the Jewish community in a very positive way in 1973, 74 or so. Uh, and I brought that film to the rabbinical school, and one of my poor professors, I'm sure, was a closeted gay man, showed up at this thing. Uh, he was very conservative. I mean, he was conservative politically and conservative in all kinds of ways. Uh, I think the film was very helpful to him, and so there were little pieces of it uh, uh, that also uh, came out. But Peter, uh, Peter, and, and John can talk about uh, whether this whole thing with Burton Weiss. So Burton eventually became an active uh, gay, gay Jewish activist. So we had a piece of that. I don't know whether we, are we still taping? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we did, uh, in our own way, also uh, pioneer in, in uh, gay liberation within the Jewish community. Uh, we, we created a film, Peter created a film. We showed it at the rabbinical school. It was long before the issue uh, had surfaced uh, in rabbinical schools and uh, and it was only it was part of the Jewish women's movement to to sort of expand issues of gender uh, and to think about who, who we excluded I and mean, we thought of it as an ex issues of exclusion uh, in those days uh, but, but we, we also had a, a New York cover I was uh, trying to promote it uh, particularly but we, we were also early on on that issue as in so many. So thank you, and we'll look forward to continuing to fill in those gaps. Okay. Thanks.